Good afternoon, everybody, and a very hearty welcome to this event. Uh, this is the second anniversary of KMOST, the Center for Atomic Molecular Optical Sciences and Technologies, which is hosted jointly by the Indian Institute of Technology, Tirupati, and also the ICER Tirupati. So this is a great privilege for KMOST to have the hospitality of these two premier institutions, Tirupati being the only city in India where both we have an IIT as well as an ICER. And between the two institutions, we have several young AMO scientists. And that's part of the reason uh, Tirupati has been chosen where this center has been set up. It is two years now, two years of the pandemic, and we certainly had hoped to achieve a lot more than what we have, but we have certainly made a beginning. And this is on completion of two years, we are having a, a ceremony, an anniversary celebration, which will sort of continue for some time. Like last year, we had a week long series of seminars for the celebration. And this time we decided to have it over a slightly extended period of time. And today is the first event. This will be followed by another, at least two other talks. Uh, today is a big moment for AMO Sciences because AMO sciences have played a big role in the development of quantum theory in the last century and in setting up a large number of experimental techniques from which there have been spin-offs in many other disciplines, including space science and whatnot. So this is a very fundamental area of research. And today we are celebrating the experimental spirit of AMO sciences. And we have two extremely distinguished experimentalists who will be giving their talks today. And uh, we have Professor Roland Vester, 
from Innsbruck and Professor Arvind, who is with us. So Professor Roland Vesta will be giving his talk online and Arvind is here with us. He has come all the way from Chennai this morning. And um, I must say that the center exists because of the vision of our two directors, Professor Satyanarayana and Professor Ganesh, who have given very generous support from the very beginning. And Professor Ganesh has joined us online, so you will probably see him on the screen. Uh, Professor Satyanarana had a, another meeting and he skipped his lunch to come and <laughs> be with us. So thank you very much. Um, so I will not take much of your time. Uh, I will only mention that uh, today's inauguration of the anniversary will be followed by two other talks. One will be uh, by Professor Jan Mikhail Roost and uh, another by Professor Sadik Rangawala. So these talks will. Uh, we, we will announce the dates. I think Professor Roost has already confirmed that he will be speaking on the 1st of October, which is a Saturday. Uh, and Sadiq's talk, we will announce the day very shortly. So uh, we will uh, request first Dr. Arijit Sharma. Uh, Arijit and Dr. S. Sunil Kumar are looking after the operations of KMOST. Arijit on behalf of the IIT Tirupati and uh, Dr. S. Sunil Kumar on behalf of ISER. So I will request Arijit to present the anniversary report. Arijit. So uh, thank you, Professor Deshmukh, uh, for the warm introduction and uh, a very pleasant uh, good afternoon to all of you. Uh, it's a pleasure to have all of you here and uh, it's a privilege uh, to be uh, hosting this event at IIT Tirupati. So as Professor Deshmukh mentioned, this is the first phase of uh, the second anniversary uh, celebration for KMOST. And uh, you know, the first phase we are hosting at IIT Tirupati and subsequently the next phase uh, we will host at Aizat Tirupati. So uh, without further ado, uh, let me move on uh, to uh, sharing some snippets of uh, the annual report for KMOS for the year 2021-2022. So I will just uh, uh, try to give, give you a brief uh, glimpse of uh, whatever we have uh, achieved and uh, whatever we uh, wish to achieve in the near future. So I'll just give you a brief overview of that. Ramesh, can we have that uh, thing? Uh, not the pointer. Uh, I want to open the presentation. Ah, yes, I will do that. What is the sharing option? So I think it's uh, visible full screen, right? Okay. So, right. So, uh, uh, our center is uh, represented uh, by a group of eminent experts. Is it fine now? Okay. Uh, so, thank you. So, uh, as I was saying, that our center is represented by a group of eminent experts that starts with uh, our two visionary directors, Professor Satinarana and Professor Ganesh. Uh, Professor Ganesh is joining us online, and uh, we have uh, our uh, director from ID Tripathi in our audience right now. Uh, we are also fortunate to have uh, Professor Deshmukh here, uh, who has uh, conceived and uh, brought this center into its existence in 2020. Uh, so right now, um, uh, as Professor Deshmukh mentioned, uh, we are uh, part of uh, the uh, team that is overlooking all the uh, administrative and scientific uh, you know, events as far as uh, KMOS is concerned. So I am fortunate to be joined by uh, Dr. Sunil Kumar from Aizat Tirupati. Professor Ambika uh, is uh, also with us, who is the chair of physics at uh, Isatirupati. Then uh, we have in the audience uh, uh, 
Dr. Koteshwar Rao, who was uh, the previous uh, Department of Physics uh, HOD at IIT Tirupati. Uh, right now, uh, Dr. Nitesh has succeeded him, and uh, he is uh, also very actively supporting the KMOS activities at IIT Tirupati. So uh, the KMOS Advisory Council uh, that you can see, we already had a, a very accomplished team of world-renowned experts in uh, diverse domains of atomic physics. Uh, so last year, uh, we uh, were fortunate uh, to have Professor Peter Brugman from the University of Minnesota joining us in the capacity as a scientific advisor uh, of KMOST. Uh, these are uh, uh, the members of KMOST uh, from IIT Tirupati. As you can see, KMOST is not restricted uh, to uh, members from the physics department. We have uh, a very diverse uh, uh, team here. We have faculty members from uh, the chemistry department, Dr. Debashis, Dr. Arun is there, Dr. Rajiv is there. Uh, and then we also have uh, faculty colleagues from the electrical engineering department. You can see here uh, uh, Dr. Murthy, uh, Dr. Uh, Guruk Belli is there, and Dr. Sopnil Guptari is also there. Um, uh, our uh, colleague, Dr. Ravi Shankar, joins uh, KMOST uh, from the mechanical engineering department. Right? And um, you know, uh, the, the vision of uh, KMOST is uh, to come up with uh, uh, science and technology uh, that uh, can come from any background. It's not restricted per se to the basic sciences. You know, uh, today's uh, science is very much interdisciplinary and uh, we wish to put this vision uh, in, in KMOST from a very early stage. So from Isa Tirupati, uh, we have uh, uh, the, the previous uh, uh, members, uh, which is Dr. Padmabati, Dr. Raghunath, uh, Dr. Shomit, and Dr. Sunil, okay? And uh, we are fortunate to uh, be joined by a few more colleagues from Isa uh, Tirupati, who are uh, Dr. Shosmita Mahapud, uh, Dr. Shorita Dotto, Dr. Rakesh Kumar Singh, uh, Dr. Tapan Chatna Adhyabhak, and uh, Dr. Ravi Kumar Pujala. Well, Pujara. So uh, most of them are here in the audience today also. Uh, we also have affiliate members of KMOS, so who are uh, part of KMOS uh, from a pan-Indian perspective. So uh, these are uh, the affiliate PIs of KMOS from different other institutions in India. So we have uh, faculty members from IITs, ISERs, and uh, other research uh, organizations who are actively taking part in KMOS activities. So uh, for uh, the uh, KMOS uh, events that happened over the past one year, uh, one of the highlights was uh, the KMOS anniversary event, uh, the KMOS colloquium series that we had last year, uh, which uh, was scheduled from August 16th to August 20th. Uh, it was a five episode colloquium series and we had very distinguished speakers. Uh, so the, the, the initial uh, uh, talk was uh, the initial colloquium. The first colloquium was given by Professor G. Ravindra Kumar, where he talked about the physics of extreme states created by tabletop lasers. And then uh, this was followed by Professor Vijay Raghavan, again from TIFR Mumbai, who talked about uh, how to build a quantum computer, right? And, you know, uh, there's so much uh, enthusiasm and, uh, uh, you know, uh, I would say, uh, activity uh, concerning uh, quantum computing, quantum technologies in general. And uh, we thought that it was a fitting tribute to this uh, demand uh, of the age of uh, quantum computing. So uh, the previous year's colloquium series, uh, if you see, uh, there is a bunch of speakers who focused on quantum computing, quantum communication. So uh, after Professor Vijay Raghavan, uh, Professor Urbasi Sina from uh, the Raman Institute in Bangalore, uh, she talked about uh, photonic quantum science and technologies. Then uh, it was followed by uh, a seminar by Professor Dimitri Budkar, who talked about the perfect defect, okay? And he was speaking about the NV centers in diamond and using them for quantum sensing. And finally, uh, the colloquium series, uh, the, the final speaker was Professor Peter Bugman, who also happens to be a member of the Scientific Advisory Board of KMOS. And uh, he uh, talked to us about the applications of uh, low temperature plasmas, right? And, you know, uh, our uh, physics department, HOD, Dr. Ritesh, he is uh, very actively pursuing the physics of low temperature plasmas and in particular applications of using plasmas for uh, water decontamination or food preservation. So 
it's a, it's a very relevant topic, right? Uh, as far as uh, the research on plasmas is concerned. Okay. Then uh, we also had a series of uh, webinars, I think. Uh, Ramesh, it's not changing. Okay, so we had a couple of uh, webinars as well following up the colloquium series. Uh, so the first speaker was Dr. Shudipto Dotto from Isaac Tirupati, and he talked about uh, tunable magnetic states in two-dimensional materials. Uh, this was followed by a seminar by our own physics department, HOD, Dr. Ritesh Gangwar, where he talked about spectroscopic diagnostic of argon rotating gliding discharges. Okay, uh, then uh, we also had the AAMOS20 uh, international conference, which was completely online and sponsored by um, IIT Tirupati, Isaac Tirupati, and Dhananda Sagar University, Bangalore. And uh, while the uh, event was hosted in 2020, uh, there was a series of uh, uh, conference proceedings uh, that took some time to evolve. And finally, uh, those uh, uh, those uh, things have come out as a special focus issue in the IOP Physica Scripta. So this is now, I think, available online. And uh, if you wish, you can just uh, have a look at all the uh, you know talks that were presented and some of the conference proceedings that were submitted. So this was uh, a, a very uh, a prominent event that we uh, hosted right after the inception of KMOS, okay? And uh, it had about 37 talks spanning over five days uh, with world leading experts, uh, you know, from diverse countries like the USA, the Europe, uh, Japan, China, Australia, Germany, France, you know, you name it. And we had an eminent speaker from that country. So uh, then uh, let me just briefly take you over uh, through the publications that have been there from the KMOS members for the past one year. So, uh, we had about 28 publications in one year from uh, different uh, KMOS members. Uh, uh, so this is, uh, I would say, uh, a comprehensive compilation of all uh, the research activity that has happened uh, you know, by the KMOS members, uh, not only present in IIT and Isaac Tirupati, but as I mentioned, we also have affiliate VIs. And so uh, their uh, contributions towards KMOS enriches uh, the growth of KMOS in a very big manner, okay? So you can see uh, we have, uh, you know, uh, papers uh, not only by uh, members of uh, IIT and Isaac Tirupati, but if you glance over uh, the other, uh, other publications, for instance, uh, Professor Jobin Jose and Professor Hari Barma, they are from IIT Patna and IIT Mandi. So they are affiliate members of KMOS and uh, we are fortunate to have their contribution enlisted under KMOS. Uh, and then, uh, you know, uh, we also had about uh, uh, two uh, book chapters or monographs published. And uh, interestingly, uh, both of them are uh, authored by our physics department, HOD at IIT Tripathi, Professor uh, Dr. Ritesh Gangwar. Okay. And this is a collaboration that he has with uh, one of our faculty colleagues in the civil engineering department, uh, Professor Shihabuddin, and uh, both of these are actually out in press. Uh, you can see them online. Then uh, uh, our KMOS members have delivered multiple seminars and lectures across uh, different institutions all over India, as well as uh, for international seminars online. And, and you can see a glimpse of those uh, seminars and lectures and talks. So we had about uh, 12 uh, such uh, events, uh, you know, uh, uh, participated through uh, the KMOS PIs. And uh, once again, this list is, uh, you know, not restricted to IIT and Isaac Tirupati PIs. It is, uh, it is a, uh, you know, pan-India list. Then uh, we had our students taking part in different poster competitions or uh, poster presentations in different conferences and uh, here uh, we highlight uh, some of their activities. Okay, so um, uh, these are uh, various national and international conferences that have happened in India. And uh, we, uh, our, our KMOS uh, PI members and their uh, research students, they have highlighted their research work uh, through these poster presentations. Then I would like to highlight uh, some of the uh, sponsored research grant, as you know, any center can only develop 
uh, through uh, mutual collaboration. And it is important that uh, we not only have inter-institute collaboration, but we also have intra-institute collaboration. And I am uh, very uh, pleased uh, to actually highlight both of this uh, in, in this table here. So as you can see, uh, this is an example where Dr. Tapan Chandra Dapak and Dr. Ravi Kumar Pujala, they are uh, faculty colleagues from Isa Tirupati and uh, they have uh, put up a joint proposal which was you know, uh, you know, uh, sanctioned uh, to the tune of 42 lakhs uh, from ACRB. And then uh, uh, we have uh, another example where I was fortunate to partner with uh, Dr. Sunil Kumar and Dr. Padmavati. And this is an example of inter-institute uh, collaboration. And I think uh, this is a, a very good example of what uh, a center like KMOS can do, okay? Uh, and uh, we are fortunate that uh, uh, we could get a funding of about 76 lakhs, uh, you know, combined all three PIs. And then uh, uh, independently, of course, uh, individually, uh, we have written proposals and they have been sanctioned. So uh, I'm fortunate to uh, highlight one such proposal by myself and another by uh, Dr. Arvinda, where he is uh, taking part in this METI initiative. So he is using uh, this uh, quantum computers to do some uh, you know, uh, research in the foundations of quantum mechanics. And he plans to use uh, some of the uh, web services uh, and time slots for uh, quantum computing simulations. So this is um, sort of the overall overview uh, of uh, what we have achieved uh, as far as sponsored research activities are concerned. Then uh, uh, we are also looking uh, towards the future. So we are building up new collaborations. So uh, we are talking to uh, other uh, colleagues in the country where uh, we can forge new uh, collaborations to uh, facilitate uh, you know, uh, mutually beneficial research. So uh, some uh, such collaborations are being set up. Uh, then um, we are uh, also formulating a few joint proposals which are um, uh, quite substantial uh, in, uh, in budget and in our objectives. And um, I think a couple of them are already in, in uh, the final phase and some of them are in the pipeline. Uh, then uh, we have this, uh, I, as I mentioned, the colloquium series uh, that was done to uh, commemorate the inception of KMOST. And then, um, you know, looking into the future, uh, we are talking about uh, further webinars. We uh, want to also have uh, a couple of uh, schools uh, uh, focusing on specific aspects of atomic physics. We had one such school last year, um, which was on quantum optics, which was extremely well received. And that school was uh, conducted by Professor Sanjay Majumdar uh, from the Department of Physics at IIT Kharagpur. And then uh, we are hoping that uh, through uh, the addition of new members uh, in KMOS, our publications also go up. Uh, we are setting up uh, uh, facilities for collaboration. So we are trying to come up with experiments and projects where uh, we can leverage each other's, each other's strengths and uh, you know, we can uh, look into a more uh, holistic uh, you know, approach uh, for for uh, forging uh, collaboration for interdisciplinary research because that is uh, what uh, science is uh, you know uh, talking about all today interdisciplinarity of the different projects right and then uh, we are trying to uh, look at programs where uh, we can think about um, giving some specialized online courses so uh, you know we are trying to uh, look into the aspect of uh, getting some international experts uh, from renowned institutions like the Max Planck Quantum Optics, uh, where um, they can come and or they can deliver some of the lectures uh, for a particular course online. So this is all in the pipeline and we hope that uh, these activities will not only enrich uh, our students, but also it will attract the young minds uh, to engage in atomic physics, science and research in general. Okay. So, uh, before uh, I end uh, my, my presentation, I would like to uh, thank uh, our both institutions, IIT and Isaac Tirupati, uh, for supporting us very, very generously uh, through the initial seed grants, uh, which has enabled uh, the uh, establishment and the procurement of a lot of sophisticated equipment, uh, starting from laser systems, 
you know, diagnostic elements, power supplies, uh, function generators. Uh, then we talk about uh, this uh, oscilloscopes, high-end oscilloscopes. Um, uh, so there's a lot of equipment uh, that has uh, been supported uh, through the seed money that has been received from uh, IIT and Isa Tirupati. And uh, I think with that, I will wrap up my presentation. So thank you very much for your patient listening. Thank you very much, Rajit. Uh, I should mention that KMOS is the first and the only center of its kind in India. And its importance comes from the fundamental nature of the field with AMO sciences. And uh, we have an obligation, not just to our two institutions, but to the whole country. And in this spirit, we have attempted to reach out to students from across the country uh, who are in various universities and they do not always have access to lecture courses by experts. So we have arranged some lecture courses. So I request uh, Dr. Padmavati to tell us about it. Padmavati. Thank you, Professor Deshmukh. Uh, can you please put up today's program? Okay, so I will, uh, so good afternoon, everybody, and uh, I welcome you all once again to today's program, uh, which is uh, CAMO's second anniversary inauguration. And on this occasion, we, uh, CAMO's organized some of the colloquium, one colloquium series, and as well as some short courses, which I will uh, talk about and uh, Professor Deshmukh uh, already mentioned about the colloquium series and this colloquium series will be kicked off today. Uh, the first talk uh, of the colloquium series will be by uh, Professor Roland Wester. Uh, Professor Roland Wester is from University of Innsbruck and he will talk about uh, the he will talk about uh, controlled interactions of coal trapped negative ions and that will continue uh, by uh, uh, another talk which is by professor arvin gopalan from iit madras and he will talk about intermolecular coulombic decay in molecules of astrophysical interest so and uh, not only that we will uh, this colloquium series will continue in the coming weeks also and there we will have two more talks uh, one will be by professor jan mikhail rost from max planck institute for complex systems germany and this is scheduled uh, on 1st october saturday and then there will be another talk uh, by professor sadik rangwala from rri bangalore and uh, this will be in one of the coming weeks and the details of which will can, can be found in CAMOS website also. Okay. And not only that, the, we will have a short course also, like last year we had on quantum optics. This year we will have a short course on uh, ultrafast spectroscopy. And that will be, uh, the course will be conducted by Professor Sivaram Krishna from IIT Madras and Dr. Binay Majati from IIT Tirupati and Professor Marcel Mudris from Arhas University. So uh, the course details of this course also can be found in, uh, in due course in CAMOS website, the date and all the other details. With that, I will um, uh, end up here and I will uh, hand it over to Professor Desmond. Thank you. Thank you, Padmavati. Uh, like I mentioned, we have had the privilege, the chemist has come into existence because of the vision of our two directors, Professor Satyanarana and Professor Ganesh. Uh, Professor Ganesh has joined us online, uh, but Professor Satyanarana is here after skipping his lunch. <laughs> so Satya, uh, please address the gathering. Uh, we are very fortunate to have Professor Satyanarana's support and guidance from the very beginning. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Deshmukh. I'll try to be brief because we're running a little behind schedule. Uh, 
and I'm sure all of you are waiting to hear Professor uh, Wester's talk. Uh, so Professor Deshmukh keeps talking about the vision of uh, the two directors, but I think it's the vision of Professor Deshmukh and the team that he put together that got this started off. You know, our job is only to get out of the way and uh, uh, make things, uh, let them do things when they're doing good things and not get in the way. Uh, I'm very happy to see the progress uh, that has been presented uh, by uh, both the members earlier in terms of the various activities, whether it is the conference they've held, whether the colloquium series, the webinars and short courses and the research grants that they've managed to bring in together uh, to the tune of uh, 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 1.4 crores nearly, uh, which is about, uh, about $200,000 if you convert it to dollars, but on PPP terms, it's more closer to $800,000 or uh, $900,000. Uh, so that's a major, uh, uh, we have, so from, from I'm sure from uh, Ganesha's and my perspective, uh, this is one center that, uh, this is our first center, joint center, and that it's taken off so well. It's very encouraging and uh, motivating for other colleagues in other areas to collaborate, uh, not only within the two institutions, but with institutions across. Like uh, he's talked about the affiliate members and how they're getting them involved and so on. Also good to see everyone getting together physically, not, uh, most of you. Uh, getting physically after two years of doing everything online. It's a big relief to see people uh, uh, coming together. And also our two campuses are getting ready. Uh, uh, of course, our IT Tirupati campus by this November, December should be mostly ready in all forms. So we'll be able to, uh, uh, and, and ICER uh, campus is also following up very quickly behind. Uh, and uh, so by the next year's anniversary, I think we have two lively campuses uh, across the road that are buzzing with activities and we can host these events in a much bigger scale and uh, probably get all the affiliate members and all that physically come here and uh, do the event. Uh, and um, one more satisfying thing I'm seeing is uh, the my our colleagues from engineering departments, whether it's from uh, electrical, mechanical, uh, civil, uh, also getting involved in these activities, uh, 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 along with the along with the science colleagues. So that's that's a major advantage of being in an institution like IIT, where your colleagues from these various areas. And more importantly, uh, we've been looking at uh, how to work with the institutions around us, close to us. Uh, we have started uh, discussions with institutions like Kriya University here near Sri City and uh, various other institutions uh, nearby. So we want to create a good uh, ecosystem for, uh, for people to come together and uh, work on this. So all the best and uh, great job uh, so far and looking forward to greater heights uh, being reached by this uh, Amos community, uh, Amos community. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much, Professor Satyendarana, for your support and guidance. Um, we have received similar support from Professor Ganesh as well. Uh, he has joined us online. So, Professor Ganesh, may I request you to please address the gathering? Professor Ganesh? Yes. Yeah, you can hear me, I suppose. Yes, we can. Please go ahead. Okay. Thank you, Professor Deshmukh. Uh, let me join uh, Professor Satyendarana in expressing our deep gratitude to Professor Deshmukh, who has not only initiated this project, but uh, is driving it very actively. And uh, the, I was very happy also to note the progress which has been done in the last one year. And we similarly had last year where we reviewed the progress of the previous year. Given all the constraints of COVID and the lockdown, et cetera, I think the faculty have, who were involved in the project have come together and already produced a very nice body of research papers to demonstrate their collaboration abilities. And uh, Professor Deshmukh himself has also stayed you know, publication of books, et cetera, with others. So overall, the research publications have been very impressive. The activity, I think that's what they have done best under the circumstances when not much of lab activity could be pursued. 
I think now that we are opened up, I think the the chemist group in you know, all the fact the faculty who are involved should now strive more towards the experimental aspects of it. You know, Professor Deshmukh initially said this is also a celebration of the experimental aspects of uh, the chemist. Now, the chemist, you know, atomic, molecular, and optical physics. And I think I'm sure all of you know that, and uh, it is very, very close to the emerging quantum technology. Uh, distant from the classical computing, you know, quantum describes light and matter at the atomic and subatomic scales. So it plays a very crucial role in solving very complex scientific and engineering problems. And there's a lot of hope that it would uh, enable us to solve very difficult challenges and develop technologies for the future. And considering this, the Indian government has uh, actually proposed uh, the quantum technologies as, a, uh, as the next leap for the Indian uh, research programs. And, uh, uh, and we know that something like around 8,000 crores or so, they have made allocation. Although it was done about a couple of years back, I think at the nation level, not much activities have started. They are yet to sort of streamline the funding, identifying people, et cetera. So in that context, I think the ICER Therapathy and IT Therapathy under the leadership of Professor Deshmukh have already started this activity, uh, putting into place some kind of an organization structure. And though we are very happy that uh, under the constraint, the faculty, they have done quite a bit of work trying to put in, it's not always easy to bring people into different uh, diverse areas under a common platform. But I think uh, the focus should shift really to the quantum aspects of it, you know, the, uh, the quantum technologies. Um, there are two aspects. One is the research aspect of it, which is happening through collaborations, et cetera. And also some of the collaborations have led to um, getting some research projects. But I think now the gear, you should also shift to training of students. I think as the technology develops, you know, in any new technology which comes up, like earlier we had IT, we had nano, the main thing is to develop or train a huge number of students who must train a workforce, which are important when the technology is coming to actually practice and take it further. I think the, the challenge I would ask for the chemos group is to really vigorously pursue uh, development of courses, you know, I mean, uh, formal, informal courses on quantum technologies, uh, because we know that they, it's a very, very wide area uh, you know, which can be taken. I think we should really now try to attract our young undergraduates through these courses focused on quantum technologies. Um, introduce some special courses, you know, give common. I think we have enough faculty to give those courses. I think training students for, you know, who'd be very useful to practice this technology or take it further down, you know, three, four, five years down the line, that's a very, very important aspect. Uh, because it is assumed that any new technology develops, it takes at least about five to seven years before you produce a workforce which can take that technology to much greater heights. So I think I would very strongly urge that if it is not done or if it is done in a, in a different manner, uh, bring focused coursework uh, you know, at the undergraduate level on anything to do with the quantum technologies. You know, I mean, I'm, I'm not an expert in that area, but I think the focus one should really bring about that. The second aspect of it is also involve our undergraduate students as trying short projects wherever is possible so that they can really see the thrill of that when they do these you know, projects. The number of activities have to be increased. And uh, one of the things which we have always been discussing is the you know, submission of a mega project under this thing. Now that the government has also realized, you know, I mean, has allocated funds, I'm not sure whether the mechanisms have already started. And uh, I think we should aim to have focused projects. You know, I think we should pick up one or two projects where which we can deliver. Um, focus projects, supply a mega project. Now, we may do a lot of these kind of, you know, uh, scratching on the surface, do several things, but ultimately if one reviews it down the line, three years, four years, what will stand out is having a very strong focus project on one or two aspects of it. I think given the engineering, um, you know, expertise at IIT and the other, and also the physics colleagues here, I think we must go in a very big way and I'm sure I know when, uh, you know, so one of these days we will uh, discuss with Professor Deshmukh and commit ourselves what kind of resources we can give right away. Whatever resources which have been generated is because of the basic, you know, uh, interest of that. But I think we should uh, uh, 
um, have very forced, uh, focused objectives and the projects where the institute can commit, you know, two years or five years down the line, what is that we are going to deliver? Just one or two aspects of it. I think there are lots and lots of challenges. The third aspect I would like to do is that it is already happening at the country level. I was told that, you know, when they have floated this uh, quantum um, you know, technology program, already the Indian Army has set up, you know, quantum computing laboratory with AI for military engineering purposes. And the uh, Center for Development of Telematics has a very big program in quantum communication lab. And the Defense Institute of Advanced Technologies also have in a very big program. And in addition, quite a few industries have taken. I think we should already should be reaching out to industries to see what kind of aspects that CAMOS can take up, uh, you know, which will have a bearing on the industry collaboration. I think we should uh, not just generate, you know, expertise, uh, you know, the soft expertise, but I think we should go on a mega forced, uh, mega projects, you know, that is my uh, appeal to that. We should go beyond, you know, having lectures, uh, you know, training program, etc. also go on the focus projects. Industry involvement, we must clearly explore. Now also I was told that, you know, 5G technology that India has rolled out and uh, the quantum internet, you know, the quantum technologies will play a very key role in, um, you know, uh, in the in the five G, uh, it will be a very key component in what they call as quantum internet. I think these are the areas where we should start to get into that um, a little bit because that is what is the future, the challenge, etc. And I think with the combined expertise of you know, and also I think if you identify and come up with a program for five years, and our future faculty hiring could be in those areas where we lack now. Uh, the real expertise in quantum technologies. So this is, uh, you know, a few of my thoughts. And uh, so far, things have been very good, but I'm sure with the COVID uh, behind us now, the people can come together, we can slightly shift the gear and start more towards focused objectives and try to write, you know, the mega projects, get industry involvement into that, and also train a uh, lot of undergraduate students who would be the workforce in five years, 10 years, you know, down the line. With this thing, I uh, I thank you know all the the faculty who have been involved in that, and I also must thank the scientific advisory council you know who are very very distinguished people who have been guiding giving ideas to our faculty in their uh, you know um, initial stages. Um, so with this thing, I would like to end by wishing this meeting all the success. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Ganesh and uh, K Mast and uh, the young team of scientists from our two institutions will continue to seek guidance from both Professor Satyanarana and Professor Ganesh, which is very inspiring, very supportive, and uh, it will help the K Mast community to continue to contribute to the develop, to push the frontiers of AMO sciences and also technologies. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, today we are specifically celebrating the, the experimental aspect of AMO sciences because it is so fundamental. And we are very fortunate to have one of the best known experimentalists in experimental AMO sciences, Professor Roland Vesta. And uh, may I request Sunil to please introduce him, Sunil? Hello, Roland. Any, ah, okay. Hello, good afternoon. Good afternoon. This, uh, yeah, maybe you can share your slide. Uh, yeah, we can bring him again. It's currently again deactivated. But I'll, yeah, uh, yeah, I can uh, hear you properly. Yeah. Okay, good. Yeah, good afternoon. Green sharing, need, need, sharing needs an activation. Yeah. Oh, okay. 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 Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 
Okay. Uh, yeah. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it is a pleasure for me to introduce uh, Professor Roland Wester uh, as uh, one of the first uh, scientific uh, to, uh, talk in a Camos anniversary this year. Yes, by Professor Roland Wester. And, uh, um, I am fortunate to be a uh, collaborator with uh, Roland. Uh, I actually did my postdoc also with Ra uh, Roland. Um, so I would like to first introduce him to you. Uh, so he uh, did his doctorate in physics in uh, University of Heidelberg in 1999, um, followed by that uh, he um, did postdoctoral research, uh, uh, postdoctoral work in the University of California. Uh, then he was an interim professor at uh, the University of Freiburg. Then he became a full professor in 2010 in University of Innsbruck. Uh, in fact, in 2012, I joined uh, his group as a postdoctoral researcher. And he was uh, head of the Institute of, uh, for Ion Physics and Applied Physics between 2012 and 2017. Uh, he was the Dean of uh, Faculty of Mathematics, Computer Science and uh, Physics. Uh, in the University of Innsbruck uh, between 2017 and uh, 2021. He is currently a speaker for uh, the FW, FWF uh, funded doctoral program of atoms, light and molecules. So he has uh, received some, uh, several awards, um, such as uh, the ERC Advanced Grant in 2020. Uh, he uh, received uh, the Broida Prize of the Free Radical Symposium 2012 and in August of Gehrs Prize of the German Physical Society in 2009. Uh, he is a member of uh, several uh, uh, scientific uh, organizations, the Fellow of uh, uh, American Physical Society and a member of the Young, Young Academy of uh, Austrian Academy of Science uh, and Fellow of uh, Uh, the, uh, so he has all, um, received a fellowship from uh, the Alexander Humboldt, uh, von Humboldt Foundation in 2020. So there are so many awards which I can see. I, mean, I don't have time to read all those things. Yeah, he has also published sure. around the 200 um, articles so far. He's one of the leading um, atomic and molecular physicists um, in, throughout, the, uh, throughout the world, in fact. So he is a... Uh, mostly focused on the collision of um, uh, cold atoms, which are trapped or uh, using, uh, he's uh, mm, uh, studying these molecules by, uh, by trapping them inside ion trap and also using the velocity measuring techniques. Uh, today, he will be talking us about uh, cold uh, controlled interactions of uh, cold trapped in negative ions. So let's uh, uh, hear from Roland what he has uh, talked to us about his work. Okay, Roland, uh, now it's over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sunil, for your kind words and for your very nice introduction. Um, and thanks very much um, also to Professor Deshmukh uh, and also to you, Sunil, for, for the kind invitation to speak here um, at the second anniversary. Um, and uh, I, I can but say I'm, I congratulate you and I'm impressed by, by your, uh, all your activities of setting up the KMOST Center uh, in what really became a pretty difficult time for the entire world, uh, in particular when it comes to collaborations and for setting up new initiatives. Um, so it's great that you have achieved this. And uh, as I said, congratulations very much. I'm happy to be here, even only virtual, um, and tell you a little bit about um, controlled interactions of cold trapped negative ions. Um, and uh, what you can see here is um, the arrow pointing towards the Institute of Ion Physics and Applied Physics in the city of Innsbruck. Um, a little bit smaller city than Tirupati, about 120,000 inhabitants live in this city that is uh, located here in the middle of the Alps um, in, a, in a broad valley uh, among high mountains. You can see the mountaintops here actually ra range up to 2,500 meters. Um, and here at the west end of the city of Innsbruck is where our institute is. And uh, uh, we work with, with ions and in my group mostly uh, with negative ions, even though you know, cation research also has been increasing over the years. Um, and uh, this basically started uh, in Innsbruck 12 years ago. And uh, as you just mentioned, he, he was one of the uh, first postdocs to join the group um, and really get, get the whole group uh, and all the activities going. So for today, um, I chose uh, essentially two parts 
uh, of uh, of work uh, that I want to talk about. Uh, uh, that is interstellar uh, ions on the one hand and um, controlled uh, quantum controlled ions uh, on the other hand. And before that, I will give a little uh, introduction into cryogenic ion traps uh, for molecular ion research. Um, I don't really have to say much about this because there are quite a few experts uh, in the audience, um, also in Tirupati, but I will nevertheless take the opportunity to also acknowledge uh, one of the um, grandfathers of the field um, on this occasion. And then I will give you a little bit more on, uh, on some negative ions um, research afterwards. And so this is the device that we've been using for 20 years. In fact, we've just recently decommissioned it um, to move on, but for 20 years, the workhorse of research on cold uh, ions was the 22 pole ion trap uh, pioneered by uh, the late Dieter Gerlich, shown here in this picture, um, who, developed, who started to develop multiple radio frequency traps um, uh, an amazing 50 years ago and was spearheading this development for, for decades. And then in about the early 90s, he started uh, with cryogenic traps to really reach down to the temperatures um, relevant for the interstellar um, medium, in particular the cold molecular clouds uh, that, uh, that have uh, created a lot of interest over the decades. And so, um, and about, yeah, as I said, about 20 years ago, um, this trap was, was built uh, for my group and in parallel, quite a few other gr uh, groups started with research and then really this sort of um, Peter's developments from the 1990s spawned and created uh, a lot of activities over the last decade. So this is the trap. Uh, it consists, as you can see here, uh, of uh, uh, cylindrical electrodes, um, 22 on a cylindrical uh, uh, surface, um, and some electrodes at the end uh, to guide the ions into this device and to bring them out again. Um, here you can see this in a bit more detail. Um, here is the cross section of the trap, the 22 rods. Um, which alternatingly radio frequency is applied. And here you can see uh, the cross section in the other direction where you can see the end cap electrodes to which a small DC electrode voltage is, is applied to confine ions and about a cubic centimeter volume in here. And so um, without going into the details of the physics of these multiple traps, what's the main purpose? The, uh, the, if you look at the effective potential um, for a quadrupolar trap developed by Wolfgang Paul, um, this effective potential scales uh, harmonically, as you can see here by the black line. Whereas when you go uh, to a higher order multipole, you can create an effective potential that is essentially flat, in this, shown in this blue line here, and then rises very quickly towards the end of the trap. So here at one is the, is the radius of the electrodes. Um, and that means that about 80% uh, of the distance to the electrodes, this trap really starts um, to have a, a steep wall. And so you can create ions and store them in almost field-free volume, which is ideal if you want to simulate interstellar environments where you know, free ions move about at low temperatures. You can put this whole trap, you could close it off with copper on the outside on all six surfaces, uh, put it on a cryostat, cool it down. Um, here it says 8 Kelvin. Our newest devices actually reach 3 Kelvin in temperature. Uh, and then one can bring gases in through up openings in the bottom um, put buffer gas uh, inside this device at uh, a wide range of densities, in fact, between, say, 10 to the 10 and uh, 10 to the 15 particles per cubic centimeter. So there's quite a bit of a dynamic range also, which makes these devices very powerful. And this buffer gas can cool the ions cryogenically, uh, cooled by the walls, and cooled by collisions the ions in what we call buffer gas cooling. Um, and the nice thing is this is very versatile. It can cool essentially any kind of ion um, and it can also cool not only the translational motion, but also the internal equilibrium of freedom rotations and vibrations. Um, and it can do so for cations and anions alike. And then if you uh, are interested more in ion molecule reactions, then you can also apply uh, neutral reactants uh, at some well-defined density and watch out for reaction rate coefficients. Um, and again, with a very high uh, uh, sensitivity. Here's a like a, a close-up of this trap. And essentially what we do is we produce ions outside. I will not talk much about the techniques here, but uh, produce ions outside, bring them in, have them uh, stored for you know, milliseconds to seconds to kiloseconds. Um, they get changed by reactant gas or by laser light, or they get lost by, by uh, photofragmentation. Um, and then at the end, we take them out again, put them into a mass spectrometer and diagnose what happens. And here's just a classic example from, from Gerli's work from the 90s just to show you uh, some of the powers also in terms of kinetics, 
And that is the N plus reaction with H2, which leads to the formation of ammonia in interstellar space. And you can see here on the logarithmic scale, N plus decays exponentially uh, by reactions with H2. And you can directly by mass spectrometry follow the different product channels here, actually the different steps that occur. First, NH uh, plus is formed here. Uh, this, this data here, uh, the larger open circles, um, but then this also decays exponentially, a bit slower, and then NH2 plus is created, and then NH3 plus is created very quickly, and then with a very small rate, obviously, NH4 plus, with a very slow sort of increase, NH4 plus is created. So from these data, you can then extract rate coefficients, um, uh, for example, these types, and you can already see they go over three orders of magnitude, so you should see the kinetic sensitivity. Um, and in fact, this is sort of where you form NH4 plus, which then by electron ion recombination, leads to neutral ammonia in interstellar. This is sort of one of the stars. Actually, this is a reaction. I could talk more about this because it's also a very complicated reaction due to quantum effects, both uh, the spin orbit uh, excitation of N plus and also the rotational quantum states and the nuclear spin states of H2, but I will not do this, um, just to give you a flavor. And you can actually see here also uh, the device uh, that has been used uh, by detail from its original publication, the 22 pole trap here, and two quadruple mass spectrometers. Okay, so this is sort of the tool that we're using, and uh, we are interested in negative ions, and in particular, uh, in negative ions that have been found in space. Uh, the, this is the list of negative ions starting 2006, within a, a few very productive years. Um, six different species have been found in space. These are linear carbon chains, starting with the uh, hydrogenated species and then also the nitrogen. Uh, bearing species, uh, Cn minus the diatomic negative ions, the smallest of these. That found. And uh, in the meantime, they have not only been found in, in one or two sources, but actually in quite a number of them. Uh, don't have all the ob objects here, but TMC is, for example, a dark molecular cloud, the Taurus molecular cloud, uh, sub, sub cloud one, and IRC is a dying star, IRC 10216, the famous interstellar um, object of a the star that exploded some time back and has produced shells of gases, uh, clouds of gas uh, coming out. Now, this actually was uh, was a discovery up until 2008 or 2010. Um, and as I said, the same species have been discovered more and more. But the question is, are there also other negative ions? We don't know. Um, given the Herschel satellite, uh, the Herschel Observatory, um, it was possible to observe all the hydrogenated species that are cationic or neutral, these ones here. But OH minus, for example, is a candidate that is very likely out there, but hasn't been discovered. NH2 minus was speculated to be out there. I just mentioned the ammonia synthesis. So ammonia is certainly out there. All these cations are out there. Uh, NH2 minus was speculated in this um, uh, article in Astronomy and Astrophysics. But doing rotationally uh, resolved high resolution spectroscopy in our lab, we could actually prove that this discovery was not, was not correct. Um, and then there are further speculations like uh, phosphated species C3P minus, similar to the C3N minus. But none of these have been found so far, and it's, it'll be you know, a combination of laboratory observations of the frequencies uh, at which these species radiate and uh, astronomic observations that are required to, to find out. But already this, this way, with these six ions, it's kind of interesting because their discovery proved that electrons can actually be bound to a significant fraction to molecules rather than being free. And if they're bound to molecules, they can, for example, not be available for electron ion recombination. So they changed the chemistry. And overall, the question has been over the last uh, 10 years or so, how relevant ha have these negative ions been for the chemistry of the interstellar medium? And thereby for the development of new stars, uh, because the fate of interstellar molecular clouds is that after some 10 to 100 million years or so, um, yeah, maybe not 50 to 100 million years or so, they typically, um, collapse into different denser cores, which then uh, collapse further into protostars and then form new um, stellar environments and in particular then also new planetary systems. And so which role do negative ions play in this, in this whole uh, astrochemical yeah, Earth region of new stars is not clear. Um, what's clear is that there are a couple of processes uh, relevant for negative ion formation and destruction. Uh, for which, however, very little is known from precise experimental studies. One is the formation process, and the most difficult to study here is to take a neutral molecule like C3N 
and an electron, a free electron, um, at the temperature of relative motion of some 10 to 50 Kelvin or so, and watch for radiative association. That's basically an impossible process to study in the lab on, on Earth, uh, but it's, it's assumed to be the most important process making negative. Another process making larger negative ions is chemical reactions, for example, radiative association, smaller anion and the uh, and the neutral. Um, then there is uh, the next process is known to make negative ions a lot in laboratory uh, environments, in particular cold plasmas, and that's ele dissociative uh, electron attachment, DEA. However, it almost always requires some energy, meaning an electron volt or so which implies that um, this process should not happen at uh, room temperature or even lower than room temperature environments in the La Clouds. Um, one of the big questions here, and this is a very personal note on this, is uh, that I'm always wondering um, uh, how quickly can electrons that are created by um, photoionization with cosmic rays in the, in the inside a dense molecular cloud, how quickly can they um, thermalized by elastic collisions, and what is the fraction of these electrons to actually be able to do DEA uh, prior to, to relaxing? So um, in astronomy, it's always nice and simple to assume thermal equilibrium, in which case these electrons are cold and this process is impossible. But it's not so clear if that's always the case, because places may be somewhat outside thermal equilibrium. This is, I think, getting into the focus of astrochemistry more and more over the last couple of now, these are formation processes, and then there are destruction processes. One of the important ones um, is ion-ion recombination, producing neutrals. Here, there's lots of assumptions for rate coefficients, um, and they're probably correct to some order of magnitude, but uh, there's very little experiment, uh, experimental evidence, in particular, uh, again, at the low temperatures. Um, nevertheless, if you look into the databases for astrochemical reactions, for example, the kinetic database KIDA, uh, which is hosted at the University of Bordeaux in France, or also at the Astrochemical Networks, the UMIST database uh, originally hosted at the University of Manchester, United Kingdom. Um, these databases are full of ion-ion recombination reactions to model interstellar environments. However, rates are often just sort of estimated. And the same was true for many years um, for photodetachment, that uh, there was no experimental evidence um, for uh, negative ions and reacting with light. There was some assumption, which again turned out to be not so bad within one or two orders of magnitude, but our experimental data actually allowed to nail this down much more precisely. And finally, um, there is uh, reactions with neutral atoms, in particular hydrogen, which is still abundant even in dense molecular clouds. The question is, how uh, are the rate coefficients for such processes that also neutralize negative? So far, there have only been measurements, and we just recently in, in my group started experiments at those. Okay, uh, let's jump right in. Um, some years back, actually, and uh, uh, Sunil Kumar was heavily involved in this work, as you can see here. We did experiments on the photodetachment cross sections for Cn minus and C3n minus, shown in these two plots here. And um, I will not talk about the techniques for this in this case here. I don't think I have time to discuss that at least now, maybe you can ask me later. Um, but we can get absolute cross sections for photodetachment. You can see the value here on the scale of 10 to minus 17 ish. Uh, Square centimeters here. Um, and here's the data point for C3N minus. And you can see in red a very detailed calculation at initial following a quantum chemical uh, calculation of the matrix elements, transition double matrix elements for this process, um, in the group of uh, Slava Kokolin uh, at the University of Central Florida in the US. And you can see the same here in uh, um, red for the C3N minus negative line calculations. And obviously, these calculations agree pretty well quantitatively. Um, with the measurements, which made us happy, of course, as experimentalists, and which also made the theoreticians very happy, because now they can trust their calculations much, much more. Um, and what this allows then um, is to turn things around, because um, in fact, the photodetachment process is the inverse of the radiative association um, in time. So a uh, free electron is produced in photodetachment, and the free electron collides with a neutral and radiative association. And so you can take the same double moment and calculate the radiative association cross section, which turns out to be extremely small, 10 to minus 20 or less uh, square centimeters, um, which makes it very, very hard if you plug these numbers into the interstellar models to uh, assume that C3n can be, or Cn for that matter, can be produced from radiative association. 
Um, and then the question is, what else? So for C3n, there is a way out, and I'll come to that in the slides. C3n has a large dipole that can allow for dipole-bound space. Cn, however, does not. And so uh, the dipole is too weak. There's only one electronic state available in the anion. Here, which means other formation processes must be relevant, at least to some degree. And one that is already included in models, and in our calculation also uh, some years back, this turned out to be a relevant reaction, is the reaction of H minus with uh, HCN producing H2 plus CN minus. And the question is, is this an important pathway also in dense molecular clouds? Uh, we have recently modeled H minus, and it seems that there is actually quite a bit of an abundance of Space that one has to account for. It, however, it's basically impossible to observe because it has no bound uh, excited state. Well, um, that was CCN, but for C3N minus, there is this dipole bound state. And uh, this has been calculated here by my co workers, Fabio Carelli and uh, Francesco Gianturco. Um, and you can see here the shape of this wave function of this, this electron bound to the dipole, the neutral dipole uh, in C3N here. Um, and actually, in recent calculations, together with Stanka Yerozimic, uh, who is a professor in theoretical chemistry, Yeah, thank you. Yes. Can you hear me again? Uh, it seems there was some network problem. Yes, yes. we can hear this. Okay, okay. Um, okay, so I think um, the last slide I started to talk about was this one. Is this correct? Yes, yes, yes. This one, I, okay. So then I come back to this slide. Um, and uh, so we're doing now uh, the experiment with, with C3N minus by putting this into our ion trap and um, using a tunable dye laser, we can provide for photons um, around the detachment threshold of, negative, of this negative ion. And we essentially watch for a loss because the neutral is not trapped, the electron is not trapped. Electron affinity was known from Dan Newmark's experiments at UC Berkeley to be uh, at this value here around in the near ultraviolet. And, uh, and so if we now um, measure the depletion signal, so the proportion to the loss rate of this negative ion in our trap, um, as a function of wavelength of this, uh, of this tunable laser, then we can see, well, this is sort of a, well, you know, it's a cross section here. There's some, obviously some background uh, some threshold, but then here's a increase. Here's the previously measured electron affinity. And then there is a more of a plateau, which is still slowly rising. So that was the temperature at 295 Kelvin in the trap room temperature. Um, and this is how we saw the cross section. Well, if there is detachment for photon energies below the detachment threshold, it implies that somewhere we have to sort of borrow energy. And in this case, it comes from internally excited states of uh, C3N minus. Um, and we could actually then uh, model this, um, uh, assuming a thermal population at room temperature of the two lowest vibrational modes of this negative ion, which in this way we could sort of directly visualize the new four mode, which is this bending mode, and the new five, this so it's cis bending, and this new five is the trans bending mode, um, which in the negative ion have 500 and 200 inverse centimeters of, of the excitation frequency. And assuming, as I said, thermal population and these ion to neutral sort of uh, uh, transitions, we could then use 
uh, model and produce all these sort of uh, this red curve which produce, uh, reproduces all these steps. Um, and so we know now that there are hot bands producing this cross section. Okay, that was a start. Now we cool down the temperature, and if you go to 16 Kelvin, all these hot bands you know, disappear completely. Excuse me. Mm -hmm. You still see or hear me? Uh, I think it was a noise from somewhere. It's okay. You okay. To... Okay. All right. Sorry about that. That was a bit uh, nervous. I hope they did it. Uh, because I think it was on my side here. Anyway, so uh, when we go to 16 Kelvin, all these hot bands disappear and we see uh, a very sharp increase. And now, of course, we were curious. And so we zoom in and we see this is a range of more than a thousand inverse centimeters. And uh, look at the width of this green bar here. Now we zoom in uh, to 50 inverse centimeters. And the uh, accuracy of the previously measured photo detachment uh, uh, electron affinity of the negative ion becomes this big sort of bar. Now you can see that there is actually some substructure. There's a, still a sharp increase, and then there's a double hump structure, and then it's, it overshoots before it plateaus out. And the question is, is this a signature of a dipole bound state? Well, in order to do uh, further analysis, we had to think about what is the cross-section behavior near such a strong dipole. Um, and I'll jump back to the negative ion that we studied previously um, in this JCP paper back in 2020, CN minus, where you can see the threshold behavior is very well behaved, I should say. It follows the Wigner threshold law. Again, here in gray is the previously measured electron affinity, again, from the NUMA group just a couple of years before. And this is an S-wave photo detachment uh, threshold, um, not exactly square root of, of excess energy, but rather 0.46 because there's a dipole. But in fact, you can see the fit you know, actually agrees with S-wave because the dipole is so weak. Now, this is very different from what we saw in C3N. And there we have to now go back to some theory that actually Tom O'Malley uh, published back in 1965. Um, that's this cross-section behavior that he found uh, from a quantum mechanical solution um, of detachment from a supercritical dipole. So a dipole with much more than this 1.6 uh, Debye dipole moment. And you can see for comparison here, the Wigner law, and up here in the solid, you can see the cross-sections for uh, such an O'Malley cross-section. And uh, that's pretty much what we see. So we use this cross-section now to fit uh, our experiment. Um, and I'll jump right to the full fit at the, uh, at the end, because now we use this O'Malley cross-section here and this fit function that I've shown here at the bottom um, with a prefactor B giving its magnitude. You can see here the rotational uh, population and London factors also, but then you see essentially this O'Malley cross-section. But this is not the whole story. We also add, um, the transition to a bound state um, with a rotational substructure. Um, and uh, this is the, because the O'Malley cross section, as you can see, gives us uh, the blue curve here. Um, on top of that, uh, in red, we have the cross section also from the transition to a bound state with a P and an R branch um, from the rotational transitions delta J equals minus one and delta J equals plus one. Um, uh, because we are exciting to a bound electronic state, um, which can have, uh, again, different rotational states on top of it. Um, and so it's the sum of which that we need. And so um, from this, we could then deduce that, yes, there is an electronic state just below threshold. You can see the energy of the threshold here is the minimum of the, you know, between P and R branch. There is no Q branch in this case uh, for the sigma sigma transition, that that's the red line. And the detachment threshold, the electron affinity is shown in blue. So just below this is where we have this dipole bound state um, at an energy that really matches the two inverse centimeters uh, difference to the detachment threshold. Um, and so with this, we could then say, yes, there is this dipole bound state. We clearly found it. Um, and uh, we also found for the first time a cross section that follows this O'Malley cross section that has not been studied before, but an interesting behavior. Um, and uh, so we understand this now. Now the next question is, is this or is this not a gateway to making negative ions? Now this requires completely different calculations um, and we haven't done those yet. So, but that's very So you see, um, 
we've moved from the big question of you know astronomical observations of negative ions in, in dense molecular or the diffuse molecular clouds or circumstellar environments to very specific detailed properties of negative ions that require quite you know delicate modeling of uh, atomic physics processes. I think that's very typical of astrochemistry that it brings together uh, expertise from various areas um, to ask sort of uh, or to try to answer you know very complex uh, multifaceted problems. Um, according to my watch here, I have about 11 or 12 minutes uh, time left. Please let me know if that's wrong. But otherwise, I would now move uh, uh, to um, uh, the second topic, and that is inelastic collisions of cold ions, um, which is moving also into the focus of astrochemistry, but it's also very interesting from a very fundamental point of view, namely understanding quantum properties of the moment. And we start with our guinea pig for many years, OH minus. Uh, OH minus is a negative ion that's also single that sigma, very stable. Uh, it has a photo detachment that can be reached uh, at around 680 nanometers uh, wavelength. That's, that's what the threshold is. And we do again the same experiment that we did before. Uh, we tune, so this is photo detachment of it. And then you see there's some excess energy that is being provided for the electron usually. There's also uh, different electronic asymptotes, OH and OH star. There's the orbit split states and there's also rotational states and so on. If we make our life simple, we tune the laser um, very close to threshold and make it tunable again. And then we scan this laser and watch for the photon. And this is something we did already quite a some time back. And you can see again, and this is a logarithmic scale of the loss rate versus photon energy over you know, a range of just about 200 inverse centimeters here. Um, and you can see uh, in blue the data we took for 20 Kelvin ion trap and then red the data we took for 50 Kelvin temperature gas. And again, you can see uh, that, that there are steps in this case. There is photo detachment um, taking place that varies with temperature. And it actually takes place below the photo detachment threshold. It's not marked here, but I think it is now. The, for, the electron affinity or the threshold for uh, internal ground state negative ions is the J equals zero threshold right here. So that's the detachment threshold. Um, this is the threshold when the J equals one states in the negative ions start to detach, and this is the J equals two threshold. And so from the plateau heights, we can map out population of these states. Um, and we could then use this for rotational thermometry, and you can see 30 Kelvin here, 60 Kelvin here. There's a little bit of an increase, and we've modeled this in detail over the years, and we understand it now as part of the radio frequency heating, because uh, the effective potential is not everything in these traps, but there's also the oscillatory motion of the radio frequency, which creates additional heating. Um, Nevertheless, this gives us access to the rotational states. And now we can play some games. And one of the games we did um, is we used the photo detachment with a very strong laser. So we're approaching one watt of power. And then this photo detachment process from J equals one, for example, can become a dominant process faster than the repopulation of the rotational state here by either black body radiation, which anyway we can suppress, or by collisional excitation. And this gave us access uh, to this collisional excitation rate. Um, again, a longer story, but uh, you can model this with the rate equation model um, shown here for the de excitation and the excitation steps. Um, and there's on top of that for J equals one, there is the photo detachment rate. N1 is the population in J equals one, and N0 the population in J equals zero. Here's a simulation for high laser intensity over a fraction of a second or so. You can see a quick drop of J equals one, and then there's a new equilibrium established. And this equilibrium is now directly a function of the rate constant for excitation. And this will then depend on the density of helium. And this gave us access to this inelastic rate. Um, and uh, we could measure this quantitatively to be of the order of 10 to minus 10 cubic centimeters um, uh, per second here. And you can see here, this is the most recent data we published last year. Um, with uh, in blue, uh, with together with two different calculations, one from our collaborator Franco Gianturco and the other one from our collaborator from the States, Richard Dawes from Missouri. Um, you can see there is a bit of difference here between the different electronic potential surfaces, but the overall trend and also the overall accuracy is quite remarkable. So this is something we spent about, a, you know, as you can see here, we spent about 10 years on, on OH minus, and we were very happy to find a new, very nice guinea pig molecule, which also has some very interesting properties. Uh, 
I'll tell you about this, where we now move uh, to vibrational control from rotation. I didn't tell everything about OH minus, but there's other things you can do with this as well. I, I, I will stop. Um, C2 minus is a homonuclear diatomic negative ion. And it actually uh, is peculiar because it uh, hosts excited electronic states far below the detachment threshold. These are shown here in purple, maybe, and green. Um, the excitation energy to this uh, A state here, you can see it here, the A doublet pi U state uh, requires about two and a half micrometers, so infrared uh, photons. The excitation to the green transition to this duplet sigma U state here requires 550 nanometers, so, um, so very convenient. The fact that these are exonically excited states available um, already led to some speculations about, uh, first of all, it allowed for electronic spectroscopy, which is a very, uh, you know, much faster, more effective tool than rotational spectroscopy or vibrational. Um, and second, it has been speculated if C2 minus can be used for laser cooling, um, because you may be able to cycle photons. There's a very nice paper by uh, a larger consortium involved, involving the CERN um, uh, Research Center and also colleagues from France, um, around Daniel Compara, uh, who published this a couple of years back. Uh, the B state has a lifetime of 75 nanoseconds, so it would actually cycle photons quite rapidly. The A state also has been speculated to be possible to do laser cooling on this transition. Well, nothing of that has happened yet, but uh, uh, still, it's an interesting candidate. Um, study. And there's also some other peculiarities because it's a homonuclear system with a nucleus with spin, with nuclear spin zero, only even rotational states exist in the X state and only odd rotational states exist in the B state. Um, now what you can do is you can uh, pump C2 minus ions with 450, uh, 541 nanometers um, uh, and then they will decay by uh, uh, Photo emission into different vibrational states of neutral. Um, and the branching ratios are given here. These are different content factors. Essentially, 70% would fall back to the ground state. That's not enough for laser cooling. So that's why uh, laser cooling is still uh, probably many, many years in the future because uh, uh, it's hard. You would have to repump everything that comes into different vibrational states. But at least you can see it. most of it comes back, but then 23% go to the um, The ground rotational structure is actually a bit more complicated because it's a doublet sigma molecule and so j equals one half is the momentum of the ground state which then splits um, by uh, uh, the excited duplet sigma u state because of the j equals one angular momentum of the mechanical rotation into one half and three half and then the ground state uh, the j n equals two uh, rotation splits into three half and five. so this is sort of the duplet kind of character of the rotation states now we started um, by detecting this again using photo detachment with 395 nanometers, we are actually below the threshold for photo detachment uh, from the ground state. And so we can only detach n equals one and nu equals one and nu equals two. So we get a perfect probe of everything that gets pumped into higher vibrational states because they resonantly absorb the, the first laser. And now we did this, uh, that's this laser here. And now we did this with a very high resolution CW diode laser system. You can see here, now we talk about spectroscopy in the fractions of inverse centimeters, um, much of it, but milli, milli wave numbers, if you want. And these are the lines that we measured. Um, and you can see they, they always get constructed of sums of either two or three uh, Gaussians, maybe yeah, two or three Gaussians in these cases. Um, and uh, the Gaussian is a Doppler broadened line. Um, and then there are two of them here because of spin rotation splitting. And in this case, for the R2 branch here, uh, actually R2 transition, um, there are actually three of them. So this starts at n equals two in the lower state and is a delta j equals one absorption state. And so you can see we could model these transitions perfectly, um, get very detailed values better than previously measured for the spin rotation splitting, also get better absolute frequencies, which are ideally now uh, suitable for, for laser cooling. And this all got published in August this year in physical red UK. And here are the numbers, you know, you can see uh, for these transitions. Um, quite a bit more accurate than known for, for this system. Okay, this is sort of for the spectroscopy. And then as a last step, we also uh, did collisions because now we pump the molecules into V equals one. And now we can add hydrogen gas and wait um, and see um, 
uh, if we can quench the V equals one state collisionally into the ground state. So it's really this time sequence that we've applied. We put the ions in, thermalized them, then we excited them for a short amount of time, then we put H2 gas in, then we did the detachment, and then we extracted them and saw how many of them were, were left. And this is already the result. The number of uh, the excited state fraction, uh, C2 minus, decays exponentially on this log plot here as a function of the number of H2 collisions, which we can control either by making the time longer that they interact or changing the density. In both ways, everything lines up on this exponential, which we can now fit. And the fit is um, nothing but the rate coefficient. And we actually get, really from this graph, you can see you know, after about 5,000 collisions, you know, this drops by a factor of 1 over e. Um, and that means 5,000 collisions is the uh, 1 over 5,000 collisions is the rate. If we convert it into, you know, with the capture rate, that's 3 times 10 to minus 13 cubic centimeters. A pretty small rate coefficient, uh, it turns out. Um, we did uh, elaborate quantum calculations, albeit and only in reduced dimensions for this system to calculate them. And you can see here, uh, this is the calculation in blue for the V equals 1 to 0 uh, quenching rate. This is the one for 2 to 1, and this is the one for 2 to 0. And obviously, the theory is significantly above um, the rate for, uh, for what, we, what we measure here in this case, about a factor of 10. And we're wondering if that has to do with the fact that we could only calculate reduced dimensions for this calculation, because otherwise, we have six dimensions for this calculation, uh, full quantum mechanically, and that is still a major challenge for, for, quantum, for quantum scattering calculations. Three dimensional rather theoretically. Yeah. Okay, and then we could compare this also for helium. The rates are even smaller. So, vibrational quenching of such a homonuclear system is actually pretty rare in helium, even though, um, yeah. uh, and in argon, it's about the same. Okay, um, my time uh, is, uh, is up as far as I, I can see here. Uh, um, I hope I could tell you a little bit about. Uh, um, uh, I could tell you a little bit about uh, cryogenic multiple ion traps and uh, specifically what one can do with them with negative ions. Then I discussed negative interstellar ions and their absolute cross sections and the dipole bounds that, that we discovered in C3N. Um, and then finally, I showed you uh, how we measure inelastic rate coefficients by you know, measuring and controlling the population of rotations and vibrations. There's a lot one could add to this uh, as an outlook. Maybe we, are, we have started reactions with atomic hydrogen. We're also very interested in three body reactions, uh, very hard to calculate theoretically. At some point. You could also nicely do experimentally. Um, and finally, I would like to thank uh, the whole team um, that has, has done the work. Um, I spoke a lot about Markus Nötzal's PhD thesis today and about Malcolm Simpson's PhD thesis, uh, uh, a former PhD student. And I thank you very much for your attention and I'm happy to take your questions. Thank you very much, Roland. Uh, it was a very wonderful talk. And um, now it's time for the questions. Um, yeah. Hello. Hello, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Um, in the OH minus detachment, I, uh, this is uh, Aravind from IIT Madras. Okay, yeah, good to see. I, I don't see you, I only see the okay. Uh, model. Okay. Uh, Black so if, but yeah, okay, yeah. Just a small question in your the OH minus detachment, the near threshold detachment. Do you see the effect of uh, the dipole? In OH is a dipole molecule, so do you see the effect of uh, the interaction with the dipole and the outgoing electron in the uh, cross section? Yes, yes. With OH, uh, this is quite significant. Um, it's been studied in great detail by Karl Leinberger uh, in yeah. several papers. Um, and we, we absolutely uh, see the same behavior. Uh, instead of square root of uh, energy or epsilon to the power of 0.5, it's about 0.28 or something like this uh, is the exponent. So yes, the, the, the cross-section near threshold is modified um, by the dipole. And in OH, it's stronger than in CN, where, uh, where this seems to be, the dipole is weaker, the effect seems to be, seems to be weaker. Okay. But yes, we see it. We 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 basically confirm what 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 has been measured. Okay, 
And another very uh, nice thing about the C3N, you had this PNR branch. Uh, it's like a textbook uh, PR and PNR branch. Do you uh, do you also see the temp the difference between the PNR peaks could give you the temperature of the um, molecule? Do you also see uh, that? Yeah. In in fact, we we needed to plug in the temperature of the ions uh, in the trap uh, into this fit, which is I believe eighteen or twenty Kelvin uh, in this case. And uh, and so yes, the rotational temperature. Um, is part of the model, um, was also shown in the fit. And um, if the temperature were, you know, if, if we were maybe not super sensitive, but let's say 30 or 40 Kelvin wouldn't fit. So we can use this again to confirm the temperature. Thank you. Yeah, any further questions? Any, yeah. Yeah, um, Professor Wester, a very interesting talk. Uh, one question I had about is this uh, proposal for laser cooling, which you said it's a, a little bit perhaps into the future. Uh, but if you could uh, kindly shed some light on, um, you know, what are uh, the possible options? Like, you know, you showed us these three branching ratios and you said that, you know, one of them has like a 70% uh, decay rate because of this fan quantum overlap. So uh, is it like a, a, a huge potential challenge as far as laser cooling is concerned? Or do you think uh, perhaps in the, in the near future, you will be able to plug these uh, gaps very effectively with some mechanism? Uh, if you could discuss a little bit about that. Mm -hmm. um, so the way laser cooling with neutral molecules has been achieved is, is really um, by brute force, that is, for every possible decay channel, there is a laser that repumps population back into the cycle. And um, for, uh, I'm trying to think, but um, so that basically requires um, a, a, a battery of lasers. Um, and with these, you know, widely spaced transitions, you basically re really need a new laser for every uh, such transition. Already the rotations are spaced by you know, hundreds of gigahertz. So you need, uh, uh, already for this, you cannot just use electro-optical modulation or so. So it's basically the brute force approach that has been successful for neutrals. Um, and I think that will also be successful here. Um, but it basically requires probably two lasers per uh, rotational, sorry, per vibrational state. So a minimum of six lasers, I think, is required and potentially uh, even more um, because, yeah, so because you have two rotational states per, per uh, vibrational state and then you have a splitting of each rotational state into two, you probably require something like 10 to 12, 10 to 12 lasers in the end. Um, and, you know, if you can bring them all together and stabilize them to a megahertz, I think then you can do it. Huh? But that's sort of, I think, what's, what's required. Plus the right diagnostics and everything, of course, you know. Yeah, yeah, I, I, thank you. Thank you so much. Okay. Other questions? Anyone else? Uh, Roland, I, I have a, a small question. So you have been talking about the rotational temperatures uh, that you have measured uh, for OH minus. Uh, so have you tried to measure the vibrational temperature at any stage? Um, so for vibrations, so far, it's all we can say is that at the low temperatures, um, we achieve V equals zero. But no, actually, no, that's not right. Um, so at low temperatures, we only see the vibration ground state. Um, and therefore, there's no temperature measurement really possible. It's basically zero. Okay. But um, the example I showed for C3N minus, this fitting of the cross section below threshold at room temperature, that's basically a vibrational temperature measure. So the fact that this fit agrees so well uh, means the vibrational uh, uh, levels nu4 and nu5 for C3N minus thermally populated with exactly what you expect from, uh, from uh, Boltzmann statistics. Okay. Yeah, uh, because in the ion trap, it is uh, normally um, assumed that okay, all the uh, degrees of freedom basically gets thermalized. So the, we we should uh, get the same temperature for the rotational, vibrational, as well as the transition, yeah. right? Yeah. So um, whether this has been really uh, proved experimentally that okay, it is within this. 
So, so vi yeah, vibrations normalize. That. This is, I think, this is the one example I know of. Um, well, the one that we've studied. There is one hot band calculation um, uh, from Tom Rizzo's group that also proved vibrational temperature agrees with the trap temperature. I think it's worth maybe it was tryptophan at low temperatures. Um, and then the rotations, uh, they should also thermalize, but then there's actually some subtle details. And, and I think probably we have some of the best data for this in the recent C2 minus paper. Um, and that is that the translational temperature should be slightly higher than the buffer gas temperature because of radio frequency heating, particularly for light ions. Every ions, this hardly matters. But for light ions, C2 minus has mass 24 compared to mass 4. This should play a role. So we see a slight increase of the translation temperature, but then the rotational temperature should uh, be um, a measure of the collision temperature. So the relative or the average of the collision between the buffer gas called helium, which say has 4 Kelvin, or let's say, yeah, 4 Kelvin, and the ion, which say has 10 Kelvin, right? And if you do a mass weighted average, then that gives you five Kelvin rotation temperatures. And, and for C to minus, we could really show this. So the rotation temperature is colder than the translational, and, uh, and it fits to exactly this model. And so in that sense, the temperatures all equilibrate, but there are some subtle differences because radio frequency can or and will increase the translation temperature a little bit for light. Uh, is it that only the translational temperature will be affected, mm, not other degrees of freedom? Well, the translation will be directly affected because the molecules oscillate in the, yes, in the electric right. field. Yeah. And then by collisions, you know, they, they, they oscillate, and so they have a slightly higher translation temperature, but then they collide with a 4 Kelvin bath. And yes. the, in the relative center, in the center of mass frame of this cooling collision, for, which is the only thing that couples to the internal degrees of freedom, um, it's the low temperature of the new of the light neutral that dominates. So the relative motion actually has a temperature that is mass weighted and actually turns out to be also almost four Kelvin, which means the internal temperature should always be colder, closer to the buffer gas than the translation. Okay, thank you. Thank you for yeah, yeah. One one more question. Yeah, uh, Professor Wester, I have a question regarding this photo detachment of CN minus you have so shown. So you have shown a case where uh, the anionic excited state is uh, low, higher than the mm, neutral excited state, right? Sorry, no, the opposite. <clears throat> the neutral excited state is uh, uh, lower than the anionic excited state, CN minus photo detachment. Thing. Yeah. Yeah, so uh, I was wondering what will happen if it is the other way around. I mean, you have shown the decay mechanism for that. I mean, the, when the anionic excited state is higher than the, no, anionic excited state is lower than the neutral excited state. So what will happen if it is uh, the other way around? So you're saying when there is a, when the negative ion has an excited state, below the detachment threshold? No, detachment threshold is uh, lower. Yeah. And the, excited, uh, the anionic, negative ion excited state is higher. In that case. Yeah. yeah. I mean, in principle, if you have an excited state of a negative ion in the continuum of the detachment, then this would lead to a resonance in the detachment yeah. cross-section. You could, you know, uh, at least resonantly populate this excited state, which has probably been a pretty a short lifetime, but in fact, uh, what I show you here in the calculations, um, yeah, here uh, in C5n, also in C3n, these this is probably such a resonance at 6 eV photon energy. You probably hit a, a, an electronically excited state of the negative ion in the continuum of the detachment, uh -huh. also here. That probably is the cause for these, you know, very broad and, and strong cross sections. Resonance. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, any further questions? If not, I think let's conclude the session. Um, thank you very much, Roland, for the interesting talk, uh, especially that guinea pig molecule, whichever we talked about, the C2 minus. I think it is a textbook uh, uh, type of molecule and can actually study a lot of uh, physics from that. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah. Uh, yeah thank you. So, yeah. Uh, yeah, now we will have a break. Um, I think everyone is uh, waiting for that. Unfortunately, 
Roland cannot join. But yeah, uh, so now we have a T plus delta T break. Just to check out what is that delta T is. Yeah, uh, I think now we are running out of time, maybe 15 minutes uh, for the tea break, and then we will meet again. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, hello, Roland. Um, we are breaking for 15 minutes, so there is a tea break. Okay. Yeah, yeah after 15 minutes, we will have Aravind's talk. And uh, if you are interested to attend, you can continue here. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So yeah. So if you have something else to attend, uh, feel free to yeah. disconnect. Yeah. Something. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm trying, okay. I'll leave it on. I have some some other things to do, but uh, but if you say certain tips to me, I try to be there. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Just stay in the Zoom session then. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Sure. sure. Yeah. In fifteen minutes, we'll meet again. Thank you. Okay. Thank you.
Nine. Yeah, I did. Come, we'll start. So welcome back, everybody, once again. Um, we are having the post -E session now. And uh, we were talking about building laboratories. And uh, here in India, means we have this tradition, especially in the AMO sciences, where people build their apparatus from the ground up. Means uh, I've seen uh, Arvind work day and night. And... Uh, we, we worked in the same group at IIT Madras, spent many years together. Uh, so these people, and this is a tradition we have in our country, especially in this field. In many other areas of experimental sciences, uh, people buy commercial equipment and do their experiments. But in AMO sciences, I think it is a tradition which started out with this uh, space program 
and physical research laboratory, those who came out of the PRL and then at TIFR. So that is a tradition which is now continuing. And uh, we are very fortunate to have uh, Arvind to talk to us. Sunil is building a wonderful laboratory over, right here in Tirupati at ISER. So is Arijit. So everybody who is over here, I especially the students, I would encourage them to go and visit Sunil's lab and Arijit's lab and find out how things are actually done. Uh, so we have uh, several Arvinds uh, in the physics community. And uh, uh, my good friend uh, Arvind will introduce the other Arvind. And uh, he always tells me that uh, there is an Arvind with a single A. Um, our speaker Arvind is with a double A. A-R-A-V-I-N-D. And our, the person who will introduce him has a triple A. So, <laughs> Arvind? Yes. yes. Thank you, sir. Uh, yes, it really gives a nice uh, pleasure to introduce Arvind because Arvind is introducing Arvind. <laughs> so, uh, Professor Arvind is a professor of physics, uh, Department of Physics at IIT Madras. He did his PhD in physics from TIFR, Mumbai, and uh, his postdoctoral ventures uh, at Arhas University, Denmark, and University of Basel, uh, Switzerland. His research interests include to study the structure and dynamics of interstellar medium through the study of its constituents using photoelectron spectroscopy, dissociative photoionization, and anthrop techniques. And to build state of art experimental setups to probe the above-mentioned interstellar physics. And he has one, I mean, which I like the most is to motivate the students to contribute to the research project and to build a career in experimental physics for themselves. He has many awards and recognition in his basket. Uh, one is Gita Ud, sorry, Udgonkar Medal for Best Thesis uh, at TIFR and ISCMP Best Thesis Award again at TIFR and INSA Young Scientist Medal for Physics in India. And IIT Madras recognized the Young Faculty Recognition Award uh, to Professor uh, Arvind uh, in 2017. This is usually awarded to Young Faculty members who have done well in research and have been good teachers in the courses. So now I request uh, Professor Arvind to present the talk. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Deshmukh, uh, for being very kind and inviting me and giving me this opportunity to talk about uh, the work that we did very recently. It is, uh, there are other friends from IIT Madras. I thought of having a couple of photographs here, but I was worried whether the time will also permit of the campus. We also have, we have a very beautiful campus in IIT Madras. You should come there. We have bees and monkeys and uh, yeah. So, 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 so Professor Deshmukh had, uh, uh, we, uh, we had a very uh, we, uh, good overlap there and uh, the, our group head, uh, Deshmukh has, had helped us a lot to build this lab there. And um, we, are, we are continuing to derive his uh, support. Thank you very much. Yeah. So today, uh, before talking about uh, this, why is this, there's something, okay, that not be a problem. There's something, okay. So the, I, before talking about the intermolecular Coulombic decay in astrophysical molecules, I will first talk about what intermolecular Coulombic decay in some detail because many of us are new, including the speaker to this field. So let us just, uh, you know, quickly go through what it is in some very detailed uh, manner. Uh, when a molecule, neutron molecule, absorbs a photon of appropriate energy, it can get ionized and ejecting by ejecting, ejecting an electron. And uh, if the photon energy that is exactly equal to the ionization potential, then you get a negative positive ion and an electron at rest. If the photon energy is above the ionization potential, then you form a cation and an electron which is 
uh, having finite energy. In the lab, most of the molecules are ha, do, do have ionization potential above 8 eV. Okay, so if you want to do it in lab, it's not that easy to do ionization using single photons because typically you have photon energies with the lasers or 4 eV or slightly above that. And if you want to do a single photon ionization, then you need VUV lasers. Okay, so don't worry if you have a laser which is which can give you only 4 eV photon. What you can do is you can focus this laser for laser beam so that you form a very high intensity laser spot. Okay. And at very high intensities, at a molecule could absorb uh, two or more photons at a time. This is what we call as multi-photon ionization. So this happens at very high intensities. So you need to focus the uh, laser. There is one important point here that we may have to remember throughout for the uh, for this talk that in such situations the ionization rate will be proportional to the laser intensity power n, where n is the number of photons that are being absorbed to create this. In this case, there are two photons that are required. So if you compute the yield of the cation, it will be proportional to the square of the laser intensity. So if I plot the ln of the yield of cation, this is the ln of the laser intensity, it will be a line with slope 2 which means I have, I have to use two photons. Now let us turn to some very interesting uh, situation, which is initial ionization of atoms. Uh, I have, I can classify the valence electrons as inner, inner valence electron and outer valence electron. The outer valence electron, electrons are higher in energy than the inner valence electron. Now, if I shine X-ray photons, I could, I could eject an inner valence electron and create an inner valence vacancy or a hole, inner valence hole. Now, this hole is unstable. Okay, It will soon decay in the sense that an electron from the outer valence will come, will fall into this and fill this hole. That's, that's what I mean by saying that it is unstable. Now, what had happened? I had an out electron in the outer outer valence that went into the inner valence that is the lower level. So an electron from a higher level made a transition to a lower energy level. So there is an extra energy that has to be released out. In some cases, it's very interesting that this extra energy is sufficient to kick another electron from an outer valence. Okay, this extra energy that, that you got by this transition is enough to remove, and this is called OJ, uh, OJ process, and uh, the electron is OJ electron. Okay. The um, so what we had is we created a hole using photon, and the the hole decayed, and then the extra energy is enough to remove a OJ electron. This is a very ultra fast process, the ultra fast process, but it does not always occur whenever you do an inner initial ionization. So let us say see an example here. Let us take a neon neon atom. In the case of neon atom, the first, uh, do we have any, uh, the red color one is for the highlighter. Is it? Yeah. So in the neon atom, the first, the 2S ionization threshold is around uh, 48 eV. And the same for 2P is around 20, um, 21.8. Okay. Now what I do is I create a hole by, um, in the 2S, by, I shine light. And I create a hole in the 2s level. Now the electron is photoelectron is ejected. Now I have a 2s neon cation, a 2s hole neon cation. And you can see that this 2s uh, neon hole state is energetically above the neon 2p hole, which means that this has to decay down to 2p hole. So what happens is the same story, I will have, and this excess energy is about 26.84 EV. Now, so I have an electron from the 2P level to fill down, fill this 2S hole. Now this excess energy of 26.84 EV is available for you. Unfortunately, this 26.84 EV is not sufficient to remove an ex another electron from this neon cation. Okay, so this is, um, and hence what happens is you cannot have another hole in the 2p level and hence the doubly ionized state of neon 
is energetically forbidden. Okay, so what happens to this excess energy 26.84? It has to be given out as photon. And this radiative decay, the lifetime of the radiative decay is about 0.2 nanoseconds. Now, why did it, why was this energy of 26.84 EV insufficient in the case of neon ionization? See, look at it. I have I required I require only 21.8 EV to ionize a 2p hole from a neutral neon atom. But now I have a negative uh, a cation of a neon. So I need more energy now. Okay. In other words, if you want to create two holes in a single site, a single neon atom, then there is a strong Coulomb repulsion between the two holes. So it's energetically very high. So, okay. And you can also see here the double ionization potential DIPs. The lowest double ionization potential is around 61 EV, which is about 2 years whole. And hence the 2s hole cannot decay to the two 2p holes state. That was the reason. So the moral is that don't have two holes in single site. So which means that there is going to be something very fascinating when you have a dimer. Okay. So I have neon dimer. In this case, what happens is the again the ionization potential to remove a 2s electron or a 2p electron from the one side of the neon dimer is the same. It doesn't vary much. Again, the double ionization potentials are also same as this. Okay. On the other hand, if you compute the energy to remove two 2p holes, uh, to, to create two 2p holes with one hole in one side, and the other one in the other side, now that they are far away, there is Coulomb repulsion is reduced. The energy required to achieve this is lowered enormously that the two side mini two side double ionization potential falls down to 45 e, 46 EV below the two S hole energy level. And hence this two S level, two S hole level could decay to the two side hole, which means that two P hole in this uh, uh, to the uh, 2p electron will fill this 2s hole that I created with photon and the excess energy will kick an electron from the next side to create a 2p hole in the other side. Okay. This is what is called. So finally, I produce two neon cations. The cation charge is there in both the uh, 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 sites. So then they have to now explode. They will explode because they have repulsion. They will explode. And they will move or uh, fly away uh, in whatever direction, but with equal and opposite momentum. Okay, that's very important. Now, this is called interatomic Coulombic decay. Okay, we define it to be the in the following way: an excitation in an atom is uh, an, at an excited atom relaxes, and by and the excess energy ionizes the neighbor. This is what is, and this is essentially an electron electron correlation process, okay, because there is a correlation between the electrons of the two sides. Now, this is an ultra fast process, and it occurs, the lifetime is a 50, 60 femtoseconds, which is 1000 times uh, faster than the 0.2 nanosecond uh, radiative decay. So, it's more efficient. So, wherever uh, ICD is possible, ICD will dominate over the radiative decay. Okay, it becomes a very uh, a dominant channel for relaxing the extra energy that is that was there in the two p uh, two p hole uh, relaxation. Now, this was actually first uh, predicted theoretically by uh, Professor Lawrence Sederbaum uh, in 1997 in uh, HF molecular dimer, which is the neon dimer is a Van der Waal cluster and this is a hydrogen bonded cluster. So again, in the neon cluster, you can see that the two p the 2s hole is uh, below the double ionization potential, so it cannot decay into this. But on the other hand, in the dimer, HF dimer, the uh, 2s hole is energetically above the first ionization, double ionization potential with one hole in each side. And hence, you can have this kind of same kind of uh, uh, columbic decay. We call it as intermolecular columbic decay now. We both are ICD now. It's a non-local electronic decay mechanism. So what we have seen here is the direct ICD. So what happens is 
there is an, a hole that is created by photon and that is filled by this uh, 2p shell and the electron and the excess energy now kicks an electron from the other side. Oh yeah, so yeah, so actually, in the case of mo molecules, you have uh, ionization. But there are several orbitals, and the ionization potential differ for each of them. Yeah, yeah. So now, what I have, what we have discussed is the direct ICD. Okay, there is something uh, interesting that is possible. When you have a hole here, this hole could be filled by the two p electron from the neighbor. And the excess electron could kick an uh, energy could kick an electron from this. this. Both can happen. This is called the exchange ICD. Both are both have the same. Both have same initial and final state. It is only the way they work is different. But for certain reasons, exchange ICD process is weaker. Okay. Now, so uh, it's it's not that important to uh, discuss exchange ICD. Now look at a very fascinating situation. I have a neon argon diamond. I, I create a hole in the neon two um, uh, s side level, and now you see that the neon two s uh, hole state is energetically above neon double hole uh, uh, the neon ar double three p holes. There is two holes in three p. Okay. Neon is neutral, and argon has two holes in it. Okay, this state is lower than this state, which means This particular state could decay down to this, and what is that? I need to create two holes in ar argon now, and no holes in neon. So what happens is an electron from AR jumps here, and an electron, the extra energy removes an electron from the argon. So this is called electron transfer mediated decay. Okay, e ETMD, electron transfer mediated decay. So which means you transfer electron to the hole site and Another electron from the donor goes on. It is it has been seen that wherever both ICD and ETMD are possible, the ICD always dominates. Okay. Now, in the case of whenever there is ICD process and if there are many ICD channels, then the rate actually ICD rates tend to increase, and you have multitude of channels. For example, in the case of endohedral fullerene. We have a neon atom caged inside C60. Then what happens is I I could create a inner hole in the neon atom, which gets filled by the outer valence electron, and this extra energy is transferred to the uh, uh, full uh, C60, and an electron gets emitted. Now there are many possibilities here. There are many sites which could decay. So the ICD rates are very high for this. Uh, has been calculated to be very high for C60. Uh, endohedral system. So, ICD is not an exotic phenomena. ICD is everywhere in nature because all all atoms in nature have environment. It is all about a relaxation of an atom and and uh, and ionizing the environment. Now, let us consider a very interesting situation for uh, a neon uh, engage, uh, enclosed in C60. You see this the two two s hole. Ne plus C60 level is above 2p hole level in Ne plus with a C60 cation level. Okay, this level is lower than this, which means that via ICD I can go from here to here. What is that? I there is a transfer of this 2s hole here will be filled by the 2p electron in neon, so it becomes a 2p hole now, and the extra energy kicks an electron from C60. So via ICD, I could come down to these levels. Interestingly, some of these levels that you reach via ICD are above uh, the uh, the state where you have neutral Ne and triply ionized C60, which means I can have an electron from C60. Okay, this level is energetically above this, so that means an electron from C60 could fill this 2p hole. And the excess energy could kick another electron from this, so I have a triply ETMD, which will lead to a triply ionized C60 plus with a neutral neon. And this is simple. We know that this can be. Uh, how do you get this? 
you simply have to do an ETMD because this energy level is lower, uh, higher than this. So again, you transfer an electron from C60 to this 2S hole, make it neutral, and there is another electron that will fly off from this. So you get neon C62+. plus. There is something much more interesting here. You see another, another level here with neon and triply charged C60+, plus, which is again below this, which means I will transfer an electron from C60 to Ne+, plus and make it neutral. And the excess energy will, uh, will be used to uh, remove two electrons from C60. It's called DETMD, double ETMD. Okay. So there's a cascade of ICD that happens here, col columbic decay that happens in the system. So very interesting. Again, Hari and uh, <laughs> they are working on this. They are going to get... Uh, so so there, there are series, several exotic predictions. Do we have an experimental verification of this ICD? That's a question that we need to answer. Let us go back to our neon. Uh, in 1997, it was predicted, and uh, 2004, there was a first uh, evidence from neon cluster. But unequivocal, very clean prediction, uh, experimental verification came from neon dimer. Okay, and this is the following. The beauty of this experiment is the following: How do I prove that ICD has happened? Simple. Once ICD, when you prepare dimer. And when ICD happens, you produce two neon cations, which have to fly apart with equal and opposite momentum. If you had a single neon, and if, when, you, when you ionize it, you get an electron. But this neon gas, which was, which was initially moving with some low, very low energy, okay, will, will become an ion and will also move with the same energy. But now I have an energetic Ne plus, two Ne plus that are moving out with equal and opposite momentum. So if you have an experimental technique to measure these momenta okay then i can i can actually have a clear indication. simple you don't have to measure anything you just measure this even you are done okay so that is the beauty of this uh, experiment so yanke and all uh, they uh, used cold trims and uh, a synchrotron radiation to measure this uh, let us also see some more additional details here apart from this uh, measurement of momentum now what is the energy that is released when I have a 2S hole that decays into finally two 2P holes? Well, it is simply 48.4 EV minus two times this, this energy. That will be the extra. So finally, when an ICD happens, there will be an energy of uh, 5.16 EV that is released. Out. And this will be shared by the ICD electron and the two outgoing kinetic for the kinetic energy of the two outgoing any uh, cations. So delta E will be shared between ICD electrons and KER. So they used uh, the uh, cold trims experiment at all. So what, what you essentially have is you have neon gas, the clusters are there, you ionize them. You can measure the electron in one detector and the ions in the other detector, okay? You can turn around, if, if, the, uh, if an ion is moving along this direction, the electric field will push it back here. So if you know, since you know the geometry and if you, since you know the electric field that you're applying, you can actually come simulate uh, the uh, the time of flight, the, the the time that ions these ions will take to fly and hit this detector. And from the time of flight, so you can actually compute what will have, what will be the time of flight of an ion which flies with equal moment, two ions which will fly equal and opposite. I can simulate that finally. And you see, this is the simulation, and this is what they have got. Okay, so it is, it is such a beautiful experiment. See, this is for the isotope uh, in the neon plus dimer, and this is for both are both are the same uh, species, and you get a very nice time of flight spectra. Uh, the time of flight spectra is exactly matching this uh, what you simulated. Further, this is uh, uh, from uh, Heidelberg. So, and uh, this what another point point is that they use. For this experiment, they use photon energy of 58.8 EV, which is lower than the one-site ionization, double ionization, but higher than the two-site ionization. It will create a NS hole, but it cannot decay, it cannot produce two, uh, two, two, any two plus. Okay. So what happens when you use this light of this particular energy? The photoelectron that you get, once you create this Ne2 plus hole, which is at 48 EV, 
the photon energy is 50 eV. The photoelectron will go with go out with 10 eV electron. The difference will go as a photoelectron energy. But we we have already calculated that 5.16 eV will be shared between the K uh, a, a nuclei, two nuclei, and also the electron ICD electron. You see this nice beautiful line here. What you plot here is electron energy. This is K, the energy distributed between KER is the kinetic energy released between the two uh, nuclei ion. You see uh, that there is a straight line. It has to be a straight line because the addition of the, this electron energy plus KER should be 5.16. So you see a nice straight line here. So very clear, very clear prediction, uh, experimental verification of in, uh, this ICD. So this was, you know, this put it in a very strong footing with Yeah. 58.8 yeah, and you can see that the electron addition if you, the electron energy uh, as per calculated icd electron energy is is being uh, followed by the experimental value and the addition of the minimum is for the ker is 3 point something and the maximum for the electron is 2 so adding you get 5.16 okay so it is is a very clear prediction now uh, how much time? When did we start? I'm sorry. 14. 14. Okay. Now, there is another interesting uh, kind of uh, ICD, which is called collective ICD. Let's see what it is. I again start with a cluster. But this time, I'm not creating any hole. All I'm going to do is I'm going to excite, I'm going to just do a bound bound transition. Like I, I can excite a 1s electron to 2p level by photo excitation. Like that, I am just simply creating, uh, I use photons, I excite both the clusters, electrons from both these clusters so that they move to the higher energy level. The photon that I use is not sufficient to ionize any one of them, okay? But it can only create a bound bound transition. But suppose if one of them de-excites and transfers his energy to the next side such that this guy is already excited, he's having higher energy, such that this can be get ionized. Then this is called collective IC. Okay. So you don't create any hole to begin with. But you can finally, so this is a classic example of you know excited, uh, excited um, uh, atom relaxing and ionizing the neighbor. The neighbor is also excited to begin with. Now, this was predicted by Alexander. And uh, Kulef, who's a student, I've been a student of postdoc of Professor Setterbaum, and uh, it was verified in helium droplets. Okay, see the nice thing about it. He, I have a helium droplet. It's a lot of collection of uh, helium atoms that are in the, their form of a droplet. I excite them with um, uh, the helium ionization potential for helium is twenty four point six eV. However. The energy that is required to do a bound bone transition between 1s and 2p is 21.4 eV only. Okay. So if I shine light of 21.4 eV, then two adjacent helium in this helium droplets will uh, droplet will get excited, will make a transition from 1s to 2s. And when this de excites and this energy is transmitted to this, this guy is having 42.48 eV, which is much above the ionization potential. So it will get ionized. Okay, so what happens is you create uh, these red color stuffs or all excited stuff, excited helium. Blue one is the new or the neutral. The droplet is electrically uh, electronically new, uh, in the ground state, and when you excite it, or there are many of them, they get into the excited state. Now some of the partners share the uh, the neighbors uh, share the energy and they excite and they form. There are so many helium cations that are formed; they cannot hold; they fly off. Okay, because Coulomb repulsion. Now, you, that is a very important thing. How do I verify this? This is the beauty of these experimental techniques. You don't need very sophisticated thing. You just need very simple, clean thinking. So very profound results are very, very simple uh, experimental um, uh, uh, efforts. Okay. So you see here, what if I have, you remember I was talking about single photon uh, ionization and multi-photon ionization. If I have a, a photon, of energy 40 eV, one single photon is enough to create HE plus. 
On the other hand, if I say I, I dump in 15 EV photons yeah, for laser with 15 EV photon, there is no transition that can be enabled by that. But then if I focus that laser, two 15 EV photons can be observed simultaneously at a, and one time by a helium atom, it can get multi-photon ionization, undergo multi-photon ionization. But here, what we do is we are actually creating bound bone transitions. The step that follows this bound bone transition is only Coulomb interaction. Is, is, that is the transfer of energy from this to this. It is involving only electron electron interaction. Therefore, in this process, although I need two photons to ionize uh, on helium by, by, via this process, the rate of ion formation should behave like a single photon process. I could have n, num n number of uh, um, a chain of n uh, containing n atoms. All of them are absorbing one photon only. And n minus one uh, neighbors could dump the energy to the nth one. Still, it is like a single photon process. Okay, So that is the key for this experiment. So what they did was, you see the concentrate on the red color dot. It corresponds to photon energy of 42.8 EV, which is above the ionization potential. So the slope corresponding to that, that I told you that if you draw a slope of the yield versus the laser intensity, corresponding to this will be slope one. Actually, this is, this is not of slope one because they have plotted here laser intensity. Don't get confused. Actually, if you take this also in the log scale, then it will be of slope one. So this, this is nothing uh, new to us. We know that uh, you can do a single photon ionization with 42.8 What about the blue one? Blue one is 20, 20 EV, which is not resonant with any transition in helium matter. So only way to achieve ionization is to focus it and at a very high intensity, multi-photon ionization could occur. So for the blue one, I should get a slope of two because two photons have to be absorbed for every ionization. On the other hand, for the black one, where it is exactly 21.4 EV, which is resonant with 1s, 2s, 2p transition, you get slope, which is less than one. Okay. Less than one. Actually, it should be one. It's less than one for some other reason because the absorption, the, uh, the bound bone transition is saturated. So, okay. But don't worry about it. It's one. It's not more than one. Okay. So, which means that this red black color dot is a clear signal for collectivizing. It's, it's, it tells me that I have bound bone transitions in the neighbors and the neighbors got de excited and transferred the energy to the one, one of the atom. So that is why you get this. Now, we have two classes of, uh, sorry, Arjit, when did we start, you said? Oh. So now we have two classes of ICDs before us. One is you create initial ionization in the neighbor and the, DX, the initial hole gets filled and the energy gets a transfer to the neighbor ionizing it. This is the initial excitation class. The other one, this requires EU uh, extreme ultraviolet radiation because you need to pluck an electron from the initial, you need to spend more energy. The other type is the collective ICD, which we just, just, just discussed. And this requires high intense laser photons. The reason is that I need to excite two units of clusters which are very close by. Both of them have to have the photon right at the same time, which means that I need to have a dense collection of photons, which means I need to use very high intensity laser to achieve this process. Okay. So I need to, this is the thing. And what is common between these two is that both work only in clusters. Naturally, you need to have neighbors which are close by so that energy can be transferred. Now, so there are so many works that are about 200, uh, more than 200 papers that are published. There's a bibliography of this entire thing. Uh, community work from this community ICD community in the web. You can go and search, search that. And at this time, we asked a simple question and uh, just barged into this community. That is, um, what if can we look at ICD in unbound molecules? That is, I don't have a cluster, but I have molecules which are far away. They're not clustered. They're monomers, unbound molecules. Now, if I excite these unbound molecules, can they do ICD? No, because they're far apart. They need to be close by so that ICD rates are start, start to increase. They need to interact. On the other hand, if there is a possibility that these excite, these molecules in their excited, photo excited state, if they interact, they also start to associate, they come closer, 
then they can do ICD. Okay, so then we start to think about what kind of molecules that can do this. If you take the pi electron molecule, pi molecule that have pi uh, pi bonds, because of the specific uh, nature of their electron cloud, which they 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 can interact very well with the neighbor molecule. In the ground state itself, their interaction is pretty decent. So that you know the pi stacking of molecules, molecules uh, two, two or three molecules pile up, forming a stack. They call pi stacking. This is all because of the pi electron cloud. If this kind of interaction get enhanced in their excited state, then super, we can just bring them together and it can happen. So what did what we did was we took pyridin monomer monomers. Pyridin is important, astrophysically relevant because quinolin is uh, quinolin and isoquinolin etc. are being detected have been detected in one of the mycelium, and uh, this pyridin forms a basic unit of quinolin and isoquinolin. And uh, what we observe here, as we, we have also found the same thing happening in other pi molecules. Anyway, so what we did was we excited 79 AMU molecule with a 266 nanometer photon at very low photon density, uh, very low intensities of 10 power 4 to 10 power 6 parts per centimeter square. And we found with the mass spectrometry that we could form cations of pyridin. This is actually very intriguing. The reason is that the ionization potential for pyridin is 9.242 eV, whereas one photon energy is 4.661 eV. So I cannot a single photon cannot ionize and produce 79 AMU cation. On the other hand, I, my intensity is also pretty low, 10 power 4, 10 power 6 watts per centimeter square, to have a multi-photon absorption. Okay, so the very formation of the cations itself is intriguing. It's it's surprising. On the other hand, we have more surprise. You see, I form not only in 79 AMU cation, but also I form cations which are heavier than the parent. All these are heavier than the parent. Note that there is a mass at 106 AMU whose yield has been reduced for by a 10 factor of 10, so that you can display it uh, nicely. Also note that I have a mass greater than the dimer. Also, please note that I have a dehydrogenated trimer cation. 79 into 3 is 236. I have 237. So I have a dehydrogenated trimer. So there are two questions before us. How do I ionize? How am I ionizing these ions? And how am I how, how are these heavier than parent cations of corn? In fact, the second question. The, the observa unusual observation of heavier than parent cation itself is a clue for this, this process. So let us just uh, look at it more deeply. There can be questions, okay, maybe you already have stacked molecules. Okay, so what we performed was we did electron impact ionization under the same experimental conditions. We used electrons, electron beam to ionize these molecules. 12 dB is just above the ionization potential. And we see no, we, we, see, we see ions that is normal because I use electron energy which are above the ionization potential, but I don't see any ion which parent uh, which is heavier than the parent cation. Okay, I see the usual parent and the uh, and the ion which is with HCN loss, which is a major channel, second major channel. So there is something different when I have a photon and uh, when I when I have an electron in the system. Okay, now let us go back to this. We form ions which means that we are also ejecting electrons. Now, if you look at this electron uh, uh, ejected from this, if it was due to a multi-photon ionization, then two photons are sufficient to eject, uh, elect, elect, ionize this spirit because 4.661 into two is 80 millielectron volt above the ionization potential. So when I look at the electrons that are ejected from this uh, process, we find that the energy of these electrons are higher even than 8, 80 milli electron volt, okay? Which means that I'm actually using more than two photons. And most importantly, what I see here is the electrons are emitted isotropically. I have a laser which is linearly polarized and the electron ejection about this linearly polarized light is isotropic, okay? Which is, which is very important to make a note on because if I, if, I, if I did a multi-photon ionization and if I removed an electron from an orbital, the, uh, 
the kinetic the angular distribution of the electrons that i get will be uh, will be will be characteristic of the orbital it won't be isotropic but on the other hand we get isotropic emission of uh, electron which is characteristic of icd electrons because icd electrons are not relevant the laser polarization is not relevant for icd uh, uh, electron ejection what is relevant is that i have an uh, electron electron correlation which uh, which uh, uh, results in the energy transfer ultra fast energy transfer from one unit to the other so there should not be any relevance of the electron polarization and hence i should have a isotropic emission so so this isotropic emission of uh, electron and isotropic emission of slow electron is a clear indication of something of like icd process but we are not answered the full stuff what about the heavier than parent cations okay so what we have is cations all these cations are heavier than the parent so what we have is we wanted to uh, study whether we are forming um, the excited molecules are reacting forming a bigger molecule okay so sajeev um, uh, who uh, uh, who who is a faculty in the in brc theoretical chemistry division he did calculation of two uh, cofacially approaching uh, excited monomers so what i have is a pi pi star excitation created by a 266 nanometer photon and i when i have two um, uh, pyridine monomers approaching you see that in their ground state they are not interact what i have here is the distance between two monomers and the association energy when they come close you can see that i form the association energy increases as they come close which means that 7.85 7.5 eb of energy needs to be released is is going to be released when they come together they, they form a strong covalent association a bond forming association which is very strong okay so which means the the, the units come at the excited state they are associating they come close and they interact and then they, they give now now that we see that we have electron energy above 80, 80 milli electron volt it is very clear that three such a molecules are coming together then you see that the excited three molecules have very nice wave function overlap as per this calculation so what we have now is uh, there is a interaction three excited molecules are associating on en route to their association there is energy exchange and there is an ionization and then the molecules also react to form these cations okay so the two photon that, that is, so that is what i mentioned that the two photon energy is um 80 milli electron volt above so but i am getting energy above 80 milli electron volt for the electron where is the energy coming from it it is it is because i have three molecules that are coming close okay that is how i can also answer the observation of dehydrogen dehydrate dehydrogenated trimer cations so we see dehydrogen and also very very clean signal of um, the this one which is more than dimer this is larger than dimer okay so what we have is um three pyridine molecules absorbing one photon each undergoing pi pi star transition and they under and uh, there are two different mechanisms that we propose in one two of them deexcite and dump the energy to the third one and this guy will eject the electron and they will uh, they are associating they form molecules which are we uh, which are the, these different fragments that we form the other one is that uh, one of them can dump the energy uh, to the excite one of them can dump the energy to this because we need only 80 milli electron volt uh, to ionize sorry we need uh, this when you when you dump this energy here you can ionize this is energetically possible and this energy can be used for fragmentation so both these are possible okay so this is the um, for the this icd is essentially collective icd only difference is that i have a photo association enabled uh, icd and most importantly what should be the slope of yield of ions versus uh, the laser intensity it's a collective icd the slope should be one but here what is enabling the icd is an association in the in the helium cluster i already had the neighbors together but here i need three mo molecules to absorb one photon each and they have to come closer and associate so i need uh, the slope as 
is expected to be 3 and that is what we observe. And you cannot get slope of 3 for a multi-photon ionization at 10 power 4 watts per centimeter square. It's very low. Even at 10 power 4, you get the slope to be uh, this. And we have observed similar pheno uh, phenomena in many pi molecules. Um, they, 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 they behave the same way. They, uh, they produce uh, larger molecules upon 266 nanometer excitation. So you just need pi pi star and transition. So one, uh, another important thing is that pyridine has an n pi star uh, transition as well, which is at 355 nanometer, lower in electron energy. There also we see these, um, most of these heavier than parent cations, but you see there 355 nanometer means I have 3.5 EV. Two photon is not sufficient to ionize pyridine because addition is uh, three, seven EV is lower than the ionization potential, which is 9.24 EV. So still we see the parent cation, which is a very clear signal that three excited atoms are participating in the pi pi star. So that is a very important experiment apart from these. So what we have is, this is happening in pi molecules. Pi molecules, essentially all of our biochemical environment is made of pi molecules, okay? So, and the intercellular medium is having a lot of pi molecules. And if you, you think, you just imagine, people talk about radiation damage because of ionizing uh, uh, ultra, uh, I mean, extreme ultraviolet light and high, very high energetic particles and all. Don't need all that to damage your, uh, uh, your, your molecule. All you need is even uh, bound bone trans energy we are observing in UV range, okay? So 4.6 EV is UV range. Even when you have a UV range uh, light, the ambient light, you could excite molecules, they can interact and kill each other. The radiation damage is more serious now, okay? So the, the, with the even uh, energy at ambient light intensity. People have question. Uh, there is a paradox that uh, the that people of there is ubiquitous presence of large polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons in space, interstellar interstellar space, and uh, the the rate at which these molecules are being expelled out of circumstellar medium is much lower when compared to the photo destruction that is possible. Okay, so people are worried, uh, wondering how these large molecules are formed. Maybe this phenomena is uh, it could answer this because. We, we excite them and they come together, they react and they form larger molecules, right? So this could, this could actually serve as a very important mechanism for growth of molecules in UV regions in the interstellar space. And finally, ICD electrons, ICD electrons are dangerous. Uh, ICD electrons are slow and slow energy electrons are known to produce uh, single strand damage in DNA. So uh, ICD has been recently uh, in th this year uh, has been uh, found in liquid water. It has been experimentally verified and uh, surplus flow energy electrons are produced, which means that in the biological environment, there's a lot of danger for uh, this. Of course, the, there are also repair mechanisms that are available, but you know, you need to take care of this damage mechanism also. So with this, I will uh, stop this. Thank you. Uh, so, any questions? Let's know. Yes. Uh, hi. Uh, so, uh, most of the experiments that uh, you discuss, they are done in gas phasing. Ah, assume correct. So, has there been any experiment done in any solvent phase? In, in, in solvent phase. In, yes, in liquid water has been. Uh, so liquid water. Liquid water, they have found uh, ICD. This is. Uh, uh, so, what was the molecule they were using? So no, no, in liquid water itself, there is ICD. No, I'm liquid. talking about in any molecule in ah. presence of any solvent. In a, mm -hmm. So, suppose we are dealing with. So, uh, in this experiment, we are dealing with uh, monomers, right? Yeah. So, how does it affect if we have a solvent environment around the monomer? Has there been any kind of studies like this? Yeah, uh, we are studying that now. Oh, okay. That's it. So actually, we are not in uh, the solvent situation. Mm -hmm. Some other, uh, so okay. hopefully we'll have some other talk soon. Ah, okay, okay. Thank you. But I, I'm not aware of any other work like that. Yeah. 
Yes. Very nice talk. I was just wondering in an experimental setup, what happened to the ejected electrons? They are slow, but they must be doing something there. No? How do we avoid that? When you have an experimental setup, uh, they, what they, happens to the ejected electrons? Ejected electrons will not uh, create any issue. The reason is that we do this experiment in gas phase. And uh, what, what can an ejected electron do? It can collide with another molecule and ionize it. But the ionization, electron impact cross sections are there. There is there are cross sections for them which are pretty low, and the number density of electrons that have, that you produce from ICD is so it's a second second order process. So you first you produce ICD electron which are already very low in number now. There are many in the sense that it's not enough to produce significant ions by electron impact. <coughs> they won't create any. But the challenge will come when you are when you want to measure slow electrons because the energy resolution will become an issue when you want to measure very slow electrons. Okay, let me find for uh, any one uh, has any questions in the online. Yeah, okay. yeah. So, hello. Am, am I audible? Yes, yes, you're right. Ah, yeah, oh, yeah. Uh, hello, Professor. Great, great talk. Uh, I have just a couple of questions. So, uh, these are like unbound molecules, right? When you say these yeah. are uh, unbound molecules, yes. Uh, at what distance? Because the 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 I mean, for example, the uh, pi pi the pi stacking is like uh, going to be effective both in the ground state as well as in the excited state. So yeah. they are unbound in in what sense? Yeah, they, uh, yeah, okay. See, what we have is uh, this is an experimental detail. We uh, the pi stack there may be some pi stacking uh, species, okay, because yeah. but we are not producing clusters in our experimental setup. What we are doing is we are not expanding this gas uh, supersonically with a carrier gas and all. So the 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 uh, we have a pulse wall which lets in this uh, pyridine gas into the, into the interaction system, interaction chamber, and the stagnation pressure behind the wall is the vapor pressure of pyridine. Okay, so there is uh, there could be some pi stacking to begin with. Okay, but they are not as significant. You see, for example. You see the uh, dimer uh, and uh, the heavier than parent carinase are super, much dominant than even the parent. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and also most importantly, the electron impact ionization, we do not see any any of these guys. Okay, okay. that is very important. So that is so the contribution from uh, the the, uh, the 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 pi stacked in, uh, systems in the ground state is not there. Most importantly, okay, let us assume that there are pi stacked dimers. Let us, yeah. let us assume for a moment, I have pi stack dimers. Uh, let me have two pi stack dimers. Okay. Uh, Again, it has to be ICD. Why? Because uh, they, these two pi stack dimers, and uh, they are far apart. Each, if I want to, uh, say three or three of the pyridine are stacked. So let us say three of the pyridine are stacked. If all of them have to absorb one photon each, I need to have a very high intensity photon because at a small region, I need to have dump a large intensity of photons so that all the three can absorb. Okay. okay. And we are absorbing this is at even a 10 power 4 watts per centimeter square. Okay. Apart from the electron impact ionization result. So this is very clear that, so you cannot, uh, the three units of the, uh, the pi stacked uh, system cannot undergo this. But even if they undergo this, it is again ICD. Yeah. yeah, okay? yeah. So it, uh, you cannot uh, circumvent that. Yeah. yeah thank, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. I think uh, just a couple more uh, uh, related questions. So what is the minimum number density you need to achieve this, this phenomenon? Yeah. So let's say per centimeter cube. Yeah. So we have a number there. What we have is about 10 power uh, 15 molecules, period, photo excited, photo excited period molecules per centimeter cube. Okay. Okay. And, uh, case, and out of uh, one second, uh, 10 power 15 molecules per centimeter cube out of which uh, every shot, every shot we are creating them and uh, uh, we are absorbing just only 20 cations. Uh, uh, uh. Okay. So that is very important to note. It should not, we should not exaggerate things. Uh, so we should, that is the so, yeah, so, uh, uh, thank you. Yeah. Uh -huh. So approximately 10 to the power 15 uh, centimeter cube is the lower limit, right? For uh, for this phenomenon to be in, uh, our, extra, in our conditions. In, in yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. And, and lastly, you know, like uh, uh, the, uh, the 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 association is formed, you know, like uh, you referred to it as, as being a covalent limit in, in the, the final association. Yeah. So, so what is the uh, marker for it? Like any quantification as to like, why do you call it like covalent excitation? Like why can't it be like... A, yeah, so the association energy is so large, it's a bond forming association. 
Yeah, what is the what is the value in terms of kilocalories per mole? Uh, I think like the bond order. I think the bond order. Maybe Sajiv can. Uh, okay, it's okay. okay. So we have a bond order. The bond calendar. order that is then in this calculation that it is associated with uh, the covalent no, thank you, thank you. bond yeah. forming yeah. association. It is. Uh, but, but but do you have any energy association in, in terms of yes, like yes. kilocalories? Yes, yes, yes. Uh, for two of them, their association energy is about seven point. Are you asking about the associated energy released? Yeah, yeah association only. Yeah, yeah. About yeah. We, we the calculation shows that we release about seven point five EV. Okay. okay and uh, is, yeah. yeah and uh, you know you know there is a very important thing we also see ions at around 20 28 amu and all if you yeah, look yeah. at their appearance energy okay for these cations it is very important that this association energy is there otherwise you can't form see you three photon let's say i have three photons in this process yeah. uh, adding them uh, i get around 12 EV. <laughs> adding them i get 12 ev but the ion cation that are formed that i form at 28 uh, mass amu the, the appearance energy uh, uh, is known to be around uh, for, from pyridin is known to be about uh, 20 ev so, okay it's more than that so it so only when you add this association energy you get exactly that you, you meet the appearance energy so you can't produce those uh, smaller cations without the association energy that's another yeah, thank you so much yeah, i think i understand yeah, thank you so much very nice talk and and, and this is like uh, very, very cool research thank you so much okay thank yeah. you yeah. thank you Pleasure. yeah yeah i think uh, hari verma is uh, yeah uh, hello arvind uh, it's a very nice talk thank you uh, so i have very simple questions uh, can we not see the icd effect uh, using electron impact ionization or excitation Uh, I, the same thing with the electron impact uh huh uh, yes i think you can do uh, we have uh, one such uh, uh, result okay we are trying to understand that in fact what we find is uh, the masses that we form by electron impact ionization and uh, in, in some different molecule okay so it's the same kind of excitation with the electron impact and photon the, the great the uh, larger than parent mass that you form are differing but this process is happening even for electron impact uh, excitation Yes. Okay. But the efficiency will be low. Okay. Okay. And just one more question. So, if there is a charge migration between two systems, you uh, have an idea how the ICD effect will be affected? Uh, charge migration between two systems in the sense like uh, if you have an endohedral system. Ah. Uh, so the in atom inside uh, the electron inside. Uh, yeah. Sorry, the atom inside the endohedral system and atom inside the fullerene. Ah. Uh, the electron from the atom can be migrated to the endohedral system. Yeah, it is. I, I discussed this. Uh, uh, the neon case, neon C sixty plus, there is a ETMD, mm -hmm. but okay. the transfer was from C sixty to neon. In that case, there was right. no transfer from neon to uh, C sixty. Maybe it's not energetically accessible. See, in the case of neon engaged in C sixty, mm -hmm. there are ICD exchange. electron transfer mediated decay so the electron from uh, you want you create a hole in neon okay mm -hmm. electron from the uh, uh, c60 can uh, can transfer to to the neon hole and another electron from c60 can get ejected so such uh, exchanges uh, there is predicted the energetically uh, calculated to be possible but i am not aware whether the energetically and transfer from neon to the outer shell is energy is uh, transferred not the electron maybe it is possible okay okay, okay. thank you aran yes sir sunil yeah, yeah. Uh, okay are uh, very nice talk and uh, very interesting work uh, so i am uh, i have several questions i will ask only one or two <laughs> okay uh, first of all what is the excited state life, lifetime of this uh, period because you said that uh, this icd is supposed to be a very fast process of the order of femtoseconds Yeah. But then where is the time to make uh, primer dimer or a no, no 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 icd when it is when things are around uh, and in and in the neighborhood icd happen when the, when the icd channel is open it is ultra fast mm -hmm. okay but your question is very important about the that that is fine right ultra fast yeah. that is uh, different it is ultra fast once they are nearby it is ultra fast that is why on route association icd happens okay yeah. okay the other question is very important that you ask that is uh, the lifetime of uh, the uh, pyridin so because they have to survive fortunately in pyridin what happens is there is an s0 s1 transition pi pi star and then there is a transfer from s1 to higher level vibration levels of s0 it goes back and forth 
there are so it, it stays for a longer time so because once you go from s1 to higher vibration levels of s0 the vibrational decay lifetimes are longer so then when you go back and forth you know it, it, some of the periodons can stay there okay any uh, estimate on the time scale no it's not available yeah yeah especially you said that the number density is of the order of 10 to the power 15 of photo excited of photo excited ones yeah. yeah yeah in that sense i would be really worried about the statement about that yeah, this can be a uh, this can be a channel to form bigger molecules in the ism because okay that would be but really not uh, exactly in the intercellular medium but uh, maybe at the uh, circumstellar the where they just just get ejected if you have then maybe that there you can form okay but yeah because yeah. You, you need the excited molecules with so much yeah, of number the other important yeah. that you need to uh, see here is uh, the lab time scales are different and the uh, it doesn't yeah, sure. can yeah, yeah. can happen there yeah, that's right yeah it also depends on the excited lifetime of the exactly. molecule true yeah. true yeah okay thank you yeah. just one uh, general remark uh, so uh, about this radiation damage uh, so usually one of the processes that one hears uh, for this radiation damage is that the excited state decays to the ground state through a conical intersection right? Uh -huh. this is the usual repair mechanism that one talks about correct so does this not compete here or is this a special scenario with no you cannot compete uh, because uh, the uh, auto the icd is ultra fast so the radiative decay cannot take over that uh, not radiative Sorry. decay uh -huh. uh, it's a de excitation through the conical intersection so this is one of the repair mechanisms that one keeps hearing from chemists that mm. you can have a uh, excitation through an x-ray yes. or ultraviolet but then it de-excites to the ground state through a conical intersection as it dissociates okay it meets a conic uh, yeah. it meets this point and it goes back to the ground state is this a yeah. special molecule where this doesn't happen no i i no i i think i should uh, study this more i i'm not okay. aware of okay. i know the i mean i understand what you're saying by the dk through conical yeah. intersection so this is this... what one says that you know we are not dissociated continuously but in our bi biomolecules we have such processes and then the molecules go back to the ground state right yeah component. actually there are some other interesting things in the real biomolecule environment mm -hmm. uh which uh, we can discuss uh, okay, see but the, in this, this gas phase uh, things are different right. there are also other relaxation processes in the uh, the, the real bio environment which uh, so yeah that is a different thing but this conical intersection thing i need to see what about it with pyridine i am not uh i need to check that yeah any questions from anyone okay so let me thank uh, for, thank you thank you, thank you very much thank you. this is the it, first uh, this is the first talk uh, uh, after the results that we are giving is a good chance yeah. for me hey it is a so, fantastic so, uh, very wonderful nice talk thank you Hey, wait a minute i didn't uh, i didn't there was in a lab is one thing what is uh, can i no but the talk i didn't uh, show the photograph of the at least my students that is yeah okay. one thing uh, i will like to mention at this point uh, arvin gave a reference to his recent paper in nature it is extremely prestigious to publish in nature and i'm very proud to mention that this is the first paper in nature in which all the authors are from india this is the very first paper of it yes that's it yeah of course indians have been writing in nature so there are many papers in nature but many of those have involved we are with... we are the third indians to write in nature chemistry yes third indians to write in nature chemistry but the first which is a complete all indian team and that is that is possible the, i just want to mention this uh, saroj my student he measured all these he did all these measurements uh, there are a lot to learn from him he is a very hard worker not only hard worker it's a constant uh, thinker on the problem okay that's very important for science say so when you enter a temple you remove the slipper out and go in you cannot come out of the lab leaving the science that you thought in, inside the lab so you know uh, he and uh, it, and especially what i uh, really enjoy is very long discussions that we both uh, 
are having and had during this ex, uh, course of this uh, work and uh, sajeev uh, played uh, uh, sajeev and uh, saroj they 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 were involved in this conceiving this three center uh, mechanism and uh, it's uh, we we uh, the it was a very exciting uh, collaboration with sajeev and uh, rajesh uh, very exciting discussing with him about this icd so we had this collaboration with uh, isro iitm um, collaboration saurav and niha uh, they also participated in this measurements now they are you know getting more involved in uh, much more than the, what they did now so they are also having their own measurements on icd with these systems so yeah we thought you know uh, these people so yeah so it's very difficult saurav just uh, to take lot of credit yeah mm -hmm. Uh, there are also some uh, new experiments which are being planned and uh, arvind and uh, rajesh kushawa uh, uh, they are into that team so is our sunil so sunil arvind and yeah. rajesh they are teaming up to do uh, some very challenging experiments in the near future so we will be hearing about it from them sometime hopefully fairly soon so thank you very thank much you, thank you brilliant talk thank you So, um, KMOS activities are driven by our program coordinators, uh, Arijit and Sunil. So, uh, they have kept everything going for a long time. Very nicely supported by the Department of Physics at IIT Madras and also the Department of Physics at uh, ISER Tirupati. And uh, the chairman of the physics department at ISR Tirupati, Professor Ambika, we are very grateful to you for all your support and also to uh, Dr. Koteshwar Rao, who was the first uh, head of the department at physics and now it is Ritesh. Uh, so both Koteshwar as well as Ritesh have uh, given great support. And then uh, there is a lot of uh, new input coming from Arvind, uh, who joined IIT somewhat recently. Uh, Vinay has been with us for some time and, uh, um, you know, also Padmavati for some time. So th there are a lot of people who are running this program and such events are possible because of the energy which all of these young scientists bring to KMAS. So there are many, uh, many persons to thank for KMAS. And then, of course, events like today's is possible because of a lot of other support we get, including those who bring tea and coffee for us. So I request uh, Vinay to please, uh, on behalf of all of us at the center, uh, I request Vinay to please uh, express a word of thanks to everybody. Vinay? Vinay's work in uh, out of fast processes is something that we will be hearing from him sometime soon. So I thank you all for uh, joining this event, commemorating the second anniversary of the CAMOS. Uh, so we had two wonderful talks today. Uh, the first one by Professor Roland Wester. So we heard about how to simulate uh, chemical reactions that would happen in an interstellar space in a laboratory using ion traps. Uh, the second talk was uh, by Professor Arvind. And he described in very nice detail about this interesting process called inter ICD, interatomic Coulomb decay. And then he also showed this new um, modification of these processes that they have done, that is ICD through photo association. So we also had uh, remarks by Professor Satyanarayana and Professor K. N. Ganesh, the directors of IIT Tirupati and ISER Tirupati. So I thank them for their encouraging words and also comments and remarks that will guide us in the near future. Uh, and I thank Professor PC Deshmukh, who has been constantly mentoring and guiding us in setting up this center. And also, I hope he continues to do this in the many years to come. I thank um, all the faculty colleagues and students for joining this event. And as announced, there will be two more talks in the next coming weeks. And I hope to see you all. Thank you. Have a nice evening.